Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. You join me once again in the slightly makeshift of COVID secure environments that is our temporary studio. Apologies if the sound is a little different to what you're used to, but it means that we can still bring you the podcast. And we are back for part two with none other than Kevin Nash talking all about his carp fishing journey. Last time, Kev, we left off with you talking about finishing the season on barking, discovering zig rigs. So let's pick it straight back up. The next season, were you still on barking, Res? Not early on in the year. I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a tots, right. totally. Which is a nightclub in South End. <laughs> Me, Tots. Um, yeah, talk of the South. It was cool. Was that the place? Hmm? Was that the place? Yeah, that was the place. Yeah, yeah. It was originally called Talk of the South because it was um one of these venues where all the uh, you know, comedians and whoever went to. Okay. Uh, yeah, you've got that one. What's that other one up in the um, side of London? Oh, I can't think. I wasn't really well, on circus, the circus. Circus Tavern. Oh yeah. You know, where, where, yeah, where so they have all the comedians and actually you know, In fact, I've seen sort of Tommy Cooper at um, Tots. Um, wow. The real top comedians in their day. Yeah. In fact, Tommy Cooper. Well, he had us on the floor. We never saw him for forty-five minutes. <laughs> they just had a spotlight on the stage door. He just saw the handle turning, and even on the other side, saying, "I'm locked out. I can't get in." Really? Oh, it's, it's, the guy was a genius. The guy was a genius. But yeah, um, then they turned it into a nightclub. Yeah. So Hazel's buggered off to Australia and I need a shag, in a word. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, sorry, my crew. Uh, but my second passion after carp is definitely women. I love women. Yeah, well... Uh, and I'm not necessarily saying for, you know, what I'm just saying. Um, I find them fascinating creatures to talk to completely. I'd much rather talk to, you know, uh, 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 a woman than, for example, stand at the bar talking football and crap with men, you know. Yeah. I find them really interesting. they yeah, they're nutty as a box of frogs, isn't they? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get myself just, into I better <laughs> shut up now. I'm going to get myself in trouble, <laughs> bless him. But yeah, so um, um, I was going uh, clubbing a lot and uh, it was well there one night. Um, at the end of the Tots night, they used to have you know, a slow dance. They used to end yeah. on a slow dance. And then a mad dance, which was, you know, always look on the bright side of life, Monty <laughs> Pythons, you know. So, <laughs> you know, those particularly drunk and extrovert like me, we'd be out the dark floor, dance floor going mad to, you know, always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> Some things never change. Some things never change. I'm wanting it at my funeral, actually. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a perfect record, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and prior to that would be a couple of slow ones. Anyway, I'm walking around and I saw this sudden, this enormous pair of tits staring back <laughs> and this bird, <laughs> this bird in a very low cut dress. So I asked her for a dance. Transpires, um, she's one of two sisters from a stinking rich father. Oh, here we go. Who lived in Chigwell. Um, her and her sister, he sent them to um, a fashion school to try and get them out of bed. Uh, <laughs> and then he set them up in a, a small shop in Hackney making couture fashion. One offs, right. one offs for. Well, I think they only ever had one client. I never knew a one woman. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, they used to get up eleven o'clock in the morning. You know, get to Hackney yeah. by twelve. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, stitch a couple of things and then leave for two. Yeah, you know, that was their day's work. Yeah, you know, I know that is one client. But anyway, um, I went up to a shop one day to pick her up on a Friday uh, to go out somewhere in London. So you, are you driving at this point? Are you using transport? Oh yeah, I'm well driving. Oh, yeah, I've been yeah. driving for years. Uh, and uh, uh, take her out somewhere in London, and I noticed this black fabric, roller black fabric, which I've held up to light. It seemed really holy. I could easily see the light for it. Mm. So I put it over the, sa- uh, the sink and tap, and the water just fell through it. Ooh. Well, a guy called Del Romang of Delkin yes, fame, yeah, yeah. yeah, he started by converting optonic bite alarms. Uh, and making carp sacks uh, out of industrial nylon. That was something Fred Wilton had written about. Right. You know, a, super, a, a superior sack to Hessian. Yeah. And in fact, I had made some sacks up um, out of um, uh, industrial nylon. Uh, and we stopped using Hessian. But then yeah, that Star when Lane I, chapter was yeah, it? Yeah, when yeah. When I saw this stuff, I thought, wow. <laughs> so I got her to run me up some sacks, and uh, yeah. then Eric saw them and Bob saw them. They wanted them, 
So I've made them for them. And then we're visiting, you know, we're on barking or whatever, or occasionally we're going off to other walks. You know, we went up to Waveney. Yeah. Uh, Rod had told me about Waveney. Well, he really knew about it before, actually, when he'd gone up there, Jeff Kemp. How long did Rob, as well, like, lodge with you for? Is it, well, when you're out and courting, I don't know if you call it that, <laughs> the, this woman, is, is, lodge still, is, is Rod still at home or has he, has he moved on? Rod lodged with me, I think, for about five, six months. Right, okay. Then uh, me and um, Hazel split up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and... So you are bachelor at this point. The house had to be sold, so yeah. he made a decision to um, get digs yeah. uh, nearer where he was doing uh, the scaffolding. Um, it was interesting, though, that uh, before he went, this was a closed season, and he was talking about this new syndicate that has been uh, uh, formed on this water in the Colm Valley, on this lake called Savvy. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, you know, um, he was I interested? Well, yeah. for sure I was interested, but I just didn't have the money. You yeah, know, I had to have a hold down a full time job uh, to um, pay the mortgage. Yeah, sure. You know, um, this was the, the one of the reasons I think me and Hazel split up was because of the financial stress on us. Um, yeah, the mortgage rate had gone up from basically what it is now, 4 or 5% to 15%. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? It was mad, you know, and from having money in my pocket, uh, we was like £200 uh, a month short. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I was moonlighting, so I was doing a full-time engineering job, then driving down to this cold little shed. And, you know, for this guy who had a one-man little engineering business he'd started, you know, he'd done his day, he'd leave me the keys to carry on for him at night. Wow. You know, and I wasn't getting in until one, two in the morning, you know. So I th that was that was a big reason yeah. for the breakup of me and Hazel, the financial stress on it. So, and I just, I had to do the two jobs to hold down the mortgage and I just couldn't afford, yeah. you know, Rod's lifestyle, really, you know, which you know, he, you know, he, would f he would put fishing before work. Yeah. Even though he had a wife, you know, and a mortgage. In fact, yeah. I told his story. I think you know, his wife Sue, she rang me up when he's gone to Savvy. This is you know, <laughs> she'd rang me up one day and said, "Had I seen Rod?" I said, "I haven't seen him for months, Sue. You know, he's gone. Yeah. You know, he's gone uh, to Savvy." I said, "Why?" He said, well, "Everything all right?" She said, "No, the, the fuckers emptied our bank account out." Oh, jeez. Yeah, you know, she then rang me again. Like I think it was the next year or something. I said, have you seen Rod? I said, no, sir. I, said, I haven't seen him for ages now. Mm. And uh, he'd gone home and cleared out some of the gear, like the TV and that. So Jeez. he'd sold it all. Sold it all. You know? Wow. Just to fund his obsession with fishing. In fact, I remember um, talking to um, a couple of the lads at Savvy. Uh, that first season, he needed to go home to get more bait, I think, right. or stuff. And uh, the car had broken down. You know, it's far, you know, what, you know, it's cars he drove around and you just take a look at him and say, you serious nowadays? Yeah. Anyway, a couple of the lads, the savvy lads, uh, all uh, got a whip going to pay for the parts and whatever, fitted them, all got them going, yeah, <sighs> and then said, oh, God, can you bring us back a bit of this and that? And then when Rob bought it back, he all charged him for the bait. <laughs> but, but that was kind of... Yeah, you know, it's a needs must thing yeah. for both me and Rod. You know, um, you know, I was trying to fund uh, a mortgage yeah. on my own, yeah. uh, a lifestyle of wanting to get out, you know, uh, you know, and have a social life with women, and still go fishing. Mm. And like, it just didn't add up. You know, the, you know, it just wasn't enough money. So yeah. that is, this is a point when I started uh, enlarging my tackle uh, empire i.e. making carp sacks uh, for other people and visiting shops and uh, trying to sell them carp sacks rod equally in the same boat he started um catch em. yeah and uh he uh, he made four base mixes one was called sucre blend one was called fruit blend can't remember what the other two are. Seafood blend. Uh, can't remember what the fourth one was called. And, you know, like little um, 
pound bags of the mixes, yeah. you know, and you just added eggs, whatever, because he had powder flavour. So I, he'd done a deal with me, um, sold them to me at wholesale, basically. Right. So um, while my, you know, I'd go up to London, my bird's house, we'd go out on a Friday night. She never used to get up to 11, 12 o'clock on a Saturday. You know, so I'd be around the shops, local to her, uh, Simpsons, not local, but shops that were in driving range on a Saturday yeah. morning, you know, Simpson term for being a good example, uh, and uh, deliver uh, my sacks and also try and sell them, you know, some uh, rods, uh, uh, bass mixes yeah, as yeah. well. You know. yeah. So that's kind of how you know, how we both started there. Uh, nice. So, yeah, that was through that close season, uh, back to barking. Um, when we turned up at 2.30, that previous opening day, the secretary had a right go at us because he said we'd been night fishing. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so we went up to the committee again. Right. And I got in to absolutely ascertain the time, which is 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. You sure it's 2.30? 2.45, 2.45. I said, okay. I said, let's agree on 2.45. It's light of 2.45. Yes, he said. So with Bill... We drove down the road uh, to the River Blackwater. There's a bridge over it, then go up this hill. Farms on the left through the hill. We drove down to the River Blackwater. It was 2.35. And I said, look at that, sneaky bastard. There's a right-hand uh, gate into the field uh, by the Blackwater. And we saw his car tucked in. Was it him? Mm. 2.35, we are cool. You know, another yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, we sit in the car. Anyway, so I, we, you know, we baited, yeah. and I picked a swim on the dam wall. I'm uh, just putting my bank sticks in the uh, soil, being really stealthy because I'm fishing margin. Suddenly, this huge beam of lights in my face, oh, no. and it's his secretary, effing and blinding. What are we doing night fishing? Blah blah. Yeah, I was. A lot more feisty then than I am now. Let's put it that way. You know? And I was utterly fuming. Yeah, I got this margin swim. I baited it. I know they're using it. And suddenly, like, you know, it's like daylight. And you know, this guy shouting and stamping. I lost it with him. I absolutely lost it. With what him. extent? How bad? To the extent I didn't hit him. Right. But I, I said if he didn't fuck off, I would flatten him, and he could stick his club up his ass. Yeah, wow. I was going to fish today, and then I wanted my money back. Yeah, because money was important to me. Now I was skint. Yeah. You know, how yeah. much did it cost? How much was that in terms of money? God, no, I couldn't tell you, mate. No. Probably ten quid. Yeah. I'll tell you how bad it was. Bill, bless him, he was a salesman, and driving all around the place, right? And I used to give him my petrol t- receipts, and he'd cash him in and give me the cash. Really? Yeah. That's how tight things were for me. You know. Yeah. So any way to earn money, like sending a few carp sack. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so, I don't know, you know th- this secretary is fishing down the river and he's turned up at like 11, 12 that day and I'm still fuming, he just looked at me, he won't come in near me, you yeah. know, he, knew, he knew violence was in the air. Yeah. Anyway, he's gone around to Bill, talking to Bill, half hour, whatever, and then he goes and Bill comes around, big smile on his face, he said, I squared it, Kev, he said, you can keep your membership. I've lost it with Bill. <laughs> have you lost it with Bill? I've lost it with Bill. So, yeah, yeah, I wanted my money back. You know, yeah. that money was, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with this arsehole and this club any longer. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't worth it. You know, you know, I wanted that big fish, but it just wasn't worth it. You know. So I fought out with my mate Bill as well. No. You know. Anyway, I got home that night and um, I told the bird that I was fishing all week. Yeah. Know, and so I'm thinking, fuck, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I thought, sod it. I woke up the next morning. It was like, no, yeah, we, uh, again, it's days, you know, remember it's dawn till yeah. dusk. So yeah. I, got, I woke up, I think, eight o'clock, red hot day. I thought, fuck it, I might as well go back up and at least, you know, make the most of the week. You You've know. got your membership as well, back, haven't membership, you? membership, yeah. So I turned up. They're all fishing. There was um, one area up by the dam, you know, parallel to the dam wall. So I just got me so-called zig rigs out. Oh, yeah. Chucked him out and stripped off, put Amsterdam layer on, and just lay back, <laughs> right? And the rods roared off, and it's the big one. No. It, it, it's mad how that happens, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I just didn't give a fuck. And after that, three years 
whatever. That's crazy, isn't the it? Biggin. Yeah, finally caught the biggin. And yeah. w- was that like job done there on there once that biggin was caught, or did you still sort of use it as as a bit of fishing? It wasn't. Uh, you know, there was there was a number of twenties in there. Yeah. I would guess at least five, six others, which I hadn't caught. I'd seen you know, over the years come out. Yeah, you know, and uh, kind of had nowhere else to fish. Yeah, uh, that you know had that number of good fish in it. You know, and kind of the job wasn't you know, done yet. And all my mates were there, if you like. Yeah, yeah. So I stayed there. You know, uh, we catching the odd one. You know, it was still a struggle. Yeah. And then uh, I never get um, in the winter. Um, Jeff Kemp with Jeff Kemp, Bill. I think it might have been a BCG meeting. Mm. And Jeff was very friendly with Dick Wild and Len Bunn, mm. two Norfolk anglers, mm. really uh, top anglers at the time. Uh, in fact, Dick Wild uh, was probably, other than Rod, the only person making bass mixes. He came up with a bait called Black Magic. Oh, it was yeah. a black paste bait. Yeah. Made of sodium casein. It wasn't a casein we use. It made it kind of sticky. And uh, he'd baited uh, Waveney with it and absolutely wiped it out. Yeah. I actually took a lesson from him and started using black dye uh, in my uh, boilies. Yeah. And I had a really great season on it. So back getting back to um, camouflage. Yeah. Um, we also did it again with a squid range a few years ago. We bought out black squid. Yeah, you know, right. um, I go against uh, the modern grain of thinking. I think um, I don't want my bait standing out. Mm. You know, I don't use bright baits or heavily flavoured baits. Uh, but then I fish for, you know, I'm a specimen hunter yeah. rather than a carp yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's a different approach. But that's something you can talk about another day, whatever, if you want. But, um, yeah, and um, I've heard a story different recently, but... From my recollection, the story I was told that Kevin Maddox and Len Middleton were fishing Waveney, D&E. Yeah. Uh, Kevin was really making a name for himself at this time. Yeah, yeah. Just smashing waters apart uh, on the cat food, barley baits. But you know, uh, clearly they had something else. You know, We thought it was just the heavy leads and the side hooking, which they were doing. Mm. Uh, we just thought it was that. you know. But they'd moved on. Um Kevin, I think it was Kevin. Kevin had a huge fish tank in his house. It might have been Lens, one or two. I think it was, no, it was Kevin, I'm sure, because I just remember where this story goes. Kevin had a huge fish tank set up in his house and they were using the uh, cart they kept in it to test baits and rigs. Yeah. And um, they was really struggling to get them to pick up the rigs and out of frustration or whatever, um, Kevin... Uh, plucked uh, a, a hair out yeah. of Brenda, his wife's head, she had yeah. long hair, tied it on the hook, tied it on the bait, to the bait to it, and the rest is history. Yeah. And that's why it's called the hair rig. Yeah. Okay. And they was smashing walls. Anyway. Kevin lost a rig in the far bank willow, broke Ooh. and pulled for a break, and this is where I'm going. I've heard another story that's contrary le- recently, but my recollection, unless it's wrong, was that Jeff told me that Dick Wield swam out, walked yeah. round the back and swam out to the willow and uh, took the rig out. Yeah. Uh, found it was a hair rig. And then well, it well, it's a hair rig. And you know, he described it to Jeff Kemp, who told me a bit about it. It goes down the chain. Huh? It Went goes. down the chain. Yeah. But funny enough... Bill in the cl- had also shown me uh, material in the closed season that he'd found a chemist called dental floss, right? Yeah. Up until this time, we're using these very thick Dacron braids. Sure. You know? And he showed me this dental floss stuff, and I stuck it in water, and basically, you know, this is um, unwaxed. You know? The yeah. filaments kind of opened up. Yeah, you know, it's like gossamer, it just disappeared. Yeah. You know? And I put it on scales, and it broke a 10 pound, which is quite heavy. But yes, for us then, you know, lines yeah. were a lot lighter than there, you know. So I kind of noted it, but wasn't keen on using the hair rig 
right. uh, for the planned start of the season because to me it was too it sounded complicated. Okay, and I'd made up this rig in my head that I really was excited about. I it was like uh, a long length of uh, dental floss to a very small. It was a stainless steel hook, actually, side hooked through small baits. Right. I just knew it was different. It just felt it worked. Yeah. So I started the season. I had four takes on um, uh, Braxton opening day. Yeah. The real relevant thing was, you know, those lads, I said, we called them the baiting machines from Darren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were on the far bank and they blanked. Really? And that was really relevant to me. Yeah. yeah. They've baited this all close season for sure. Yeah. They was there with all their you know, edges and they blanked and I smashed it. Mm. Bill had one on the hair rig. Right. Okay. Uh, and never looked back. Um, I don't know. I must have then tried the hair rig and the hair rig started out fishing uh, my um, the, dental yeah. floss rig. Yeah. So we're kind of... Two, three weeks into the season, I am smashing it. Absolutely smashing yeah. it. I was top rod. Mick Linzel was scarily catching me up, though. You know, really oh. good angler. You yeah, know, yeah. You know, Mick and Zen are there. Mick Linzel was scarily catching me up. Because he, um, he was catching them on floaters. It was the first time I ever saw mixers being used. Right. And so if the conditions were right, he was catching on them. Uh, yeah, yeah, like I am set up to yeah. really, uh, you know, really uh, smash barking and finish it once and for all. And then um, I think I'd say it was three weeks into it. I uh, used to get up there on a Friday afternoon, fish Friday through to Saturday. Night <laughs> fishing. Then I'd go and see me bird. Yeah. And then um, you know, maybe one, um, no, that was it basically. Yeah. Used to fish through, yeah, that's all we did. Yeah, Friday food to Saturday evening. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I was really smashing it. Anyway, this guy turns up, and he said he'd just been over a gravel pit of Silver End, and he's seen this monster carp caught, thirty-seven pound. Oh, what? Yeah, you know. What's your PB at this time? Twenty. It's Henry, you know, the oh, barking fish. Oh, right, which yeah, yeah. Actually, it happened. It was twenty-four and three quarters. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it was twenty-four. So that fish had spawned out. I'd caught it just after it spawned. Uh, right. it's, not, it's coming out 27, 28. Yeah, up at 20. So it's a little bit down. And this is 37 pounds. Mm-hmm. We're talking a monster. Yeah. An absolute monster now. You know, the biggest fish in Essex and well beyond. Yeah. Um, it was a club called Kelvinham. Yeah. I pulled up. I, uh, it, he told me about three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I packed up and got to the local tackle shop before it closed uh, and bought a ticket. Yeah. And um, I'll never forget it. I, before I tell you that, by the way, so again about coincidences and things going full circle. When I was a, a, a kid, uh, my grandparents lived at uh, basically just outside Whitham. Right. A place called Rivenhall. Okay. Little village there. And I used to go and stay with them. You know, my you know, passion for wanting to be outside in the country. I used to love that area because there used to be a lot of pheasants. Right. Yeah, you know, I used to wander across all the farm fields and suddenly a pheasant would come flying. You didn't get pheasants around Rayleigh. You know, right. So I used to love it. Anyway, um, I used to sometimes get my granddad to take me for a walk up the road. If you walked up the road for, I would guess, a couple of miles, there was um, another beautiful, you know, not, I wouldn't call it a stately home, but it was a superb house, you know, farm yeah. farmland and a lake in front of it. And then if you walked past that, round the back for another like half mile up the road, was a small gravel pit. Yeah. Um, uh, used to get him to walk me up to both of them. You know, um, that was very raw. Well, that was Silver End. Was it? Mm. That is weird, isn't that it? That is weird. So anyway, so the next Friday, um, I'm not going to bark in there. I've gone to Silver End. And uh, I'll never forget, I turned up when it was dark. I think I'd promised to take the bird out and couldn't get away from it <laughs> until really late <laughs> and it's quite late um so i just got out of the car park and i just thought well i just plonk you know in the first swim yeah which is what i did you know i didn't know anything about it you know i was just happy to be there and it was a full moon and i just cast out not expecting anything to happen and the rod roared off wow and i hooked into this fish and you know, immense power yeah you know, and I'll never forget that battle, 
you know, I've got the lake to myself, this full moon, yeah. and I'm playing this, you know, fish of this monster of immense power. Yeah. I'll never forget that. You know, I so, bet you so, won't. so I hadn't, you know, I'd only been there. Yeah. That's what I mean. I mean, what oh, must be going true. for your head? This is a thirty-seven pounder. Like, here we go. Or what? What? What the hell's in it? You know, yeah, it was, it was yeah. actually. Um, I say only. You know, it was a good fish. I think it was eighteen pound, but it was like massively long. And yeah, lean. yeah. And that's um, um, yeah. My start on silver end. Uh, so yeah. you, is this is <coughs> it's hair rigs and it's you've not got your dental floss side hooking rig. You've it's got, hair rigs yeah. now. Um, I I use the particles a lot uh, that mm. first season uh, just because they were more. Uh, successful then, you know, me, uh, you know, me H&Bs. H&Bs and yeah. again, yeah, the one thing, one of the biggest lessons I yeah. have learned through all the years of carp fishing is um, you know, recognition, bait recognition. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it used, to, we used to think we was mugs, you know, we'd move on the water, two, three years of struggling and then it just start coming good and someone would come along and tear it up. Well, yeah, yeah. The fact was, the amount of bait yes. we was putting in, it took those carp two, three years to get on it. You know, uh, you know and there was a fishing silver, the, the, the silver end, for example. Um, that fish was only caught on particles for three years before it took a, an HMV. Yeah. You know, so, it, you know, some fish take even longer to recognise. I guess a lot of people, you know, it's thick and whatever. <laughs> you know, so, so I was on particles um, that first year, um, and one of the next big lessons I learned was about bite offs. You know, mm. uh, several times I've had a screaming take and yeah. like my hook links failed. But yeah, you know, I really trusted that dental floss. I was on that dental floss, but you know, uh, with hair you know, mm. And I really trusted it, you know, because it's using relatively soft rods. You know, I just couldn't believe it. Like, you know, yeah. hook links failing. And then I realised um, you know, what it was. I was getting bitten off. Mad. You know, so uh, large volumes of bait. The carp aren't moving; they're just basically sitting on it, yeah. and so you the hook link's too long. You're letting them take it back too far, you know, and they're biting you off. You know, so yeah, that's another part of the experience. That's mad, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely mad. Yeah, a lot went on at um, Silver. And to be honest, if we start talking about the Silver End era, yeah, well, we're going to be all night. So yeah, that's one for maybe another day. I've sectioned that off, Kev. We're yeah. definitely going to do Silver End on its own, but mm. look out for that coming up on Ash TV at some point in the future. Moving on, sort of, we briefly sketched over Silver End. Um, where is where is the carp sack selling Nash tackle sort of beginnings at this stage, mate? Are you still doing that on the side to, to keep a bit of income coming in or, or not? It's getting more serious now. Right. Um, I'm basically, yeah, um, I'm supplying a number of shops now. Yeah. Uh, and the demand... Is there? I've expanded the range. Inverted commas. Um, I'm doing uh, slings now. Yeah. And stainless steel needles. You know, we used to uh, you know, silver paper, whatever bottle tops, bottle tops. Then, but yeah, you know, they blow in the wind because you have the rods so high. Yeah. So we used to slide them down needles. You know, uh, like eight eighth inch thick stainless needles we stick in the ground. Right. Um, I was selling them at shows, uh, and of course me flavors. Um, I've actually started a company now. Yeah, you know, I'm called Happy Hooker Bait and Tackle. Yeah. I've told the story. You know, I named I named <laughs> I named it Happy Hooker after the title of a book about an American prostitute. <laughs> you know, that's how seriously I took it. You know, um, it was just a means to an end to go fishing. So I had um, my carp sacks, my slings, stainless steel needles. Mm. I had a couple of other things that I made, like a sack extension cord to put it in deep water. Yeah, uh, and I had my carp crave range of flavors. Yeah. Um, I'd put a lot of work into the flavours. You know, I knew from the lanes range, I knew what worked and what didn't, and what worked in parkers and what worked in um, the HMVs. And I was quite a good um, uh, customer base. So I was mail order. The Carp Society started around this time. Yeah. Probably I made out the CIA. Uh, I don't know when the CIA started, but I was advertising in. Carp Society Mag, I think it was around this time. Possibly. So this is a lot more developed in terms of oh, business. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm mainly mail order, okay. direct, uh, and also supplying a few shops as well. But the demand yeah. is growing in terms of the number of shops contacting me and the more the shops wanted that I was supplying, 
But yeah, the problem is I also want to go fishing. <laughs> yeah. And I've got a bird. Yeah, you know, so Yeah, you're spinning plates everywhere. I'm spinning plates everywhere, yeah, but you know, but the fact was, you know, uh, the phone wasn't answered from June the fifteenth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was more of a winter you know, yeah. flow season thing. Yeah. yeah. And there was a, quite a lot of uh, pissed off retailers, I think, at this time. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I'm guessing no, though, the, really, huh? the uptake from sort of the anglers and uh, and everybody <coughs> around it was would would have been mega, wouldn't it? Because there's not a lot about, is there? Product wise. Carp sack wise, the feedback must have been good, and then whatever you put in must have gone relatively quickly. I'd imagine we're talking the beginning of the eighties, yeah, and it might be really mad for um, you know, listeners to understand this, but um, from what I've said prior, uh, we've now only got carp sacks, slings. Um, I say the bite alarms have progressed. Optonic have yeah. brought have brought out this. Amazing bite alarm. But the problem was the battery drain was big because it had a light beam breaking a paddle when the wheel went round, mm. and that was on permanently. So um, Delg Romang was converting them to a, yeah. a magnet and a reed switch. So in other words, it only uh, took battery power when you got a bite. Um, so he also, as I said, was doing uh, carp sacks out of Industrial 9 and slings. Mm. Uh and other than the tackle shops, uh, custom building rods, uh, say in the landing nets, that was still it. In fact, right. maybe you put a picture up. You know, um, my I did a little black and white catalogue with um, Henry from uh, Braxford on the front, actually. Uh, and in that, as I say, all that's got is what I've told you. you know, wow. You know, that's the, in fact, um, this girl I was going out with from Chigwell, like I said, her dad was mega rich and he, he just wanted her married off, I think, yeah. And I, I ended up using their house for factory <laughs> at weekends, you know, so. You know, she so. was a right fine though, really, because she had source-like materials, which helped you out. And obviously, if you're using, <laughs> using the old place for a factory, that is... Uh, well, like I said, yeah. you know, so she used to... Um, you know, I'll take, I'm, I'm, as you say, juggling balls. You know, I'm taking her yeah. out. Say on a Saturday night, um, staying up, she go to bed. Yeah, you know, I've already, I've, I'm sewing up my own sacks at this time mm. because she's got fed up with it. You know, so I'm finishing work on a Friday, going up to her shop. She's giving me the keys. I'm sewing up my sacks, right? <laughs> uh, and then um, I'm taking them back. I'm going back to hers, taking her out. She's going to bed. I'm threading all the calls through, oh putting the toggles God. on, yeah. melting them and packing them. You know, this is now two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And mum was, uh, uh, couldn't sleep. What's the call? call Insomnia? Insomnia. She couldn't sleep. She's, you know, what I said about women, you know, I find them <laughs> interesting to talk to. So I actually had a better relationship with her mother than her. Steady. You know, in terms of, <laughs> yeah, you know, talking and meaningful stuff, you know. Yeah. So, and then, so um, I'd have a couple of hours of sleep and then get up and be standing in front of, Jack Simpson's shop or bait seventy eight seven nine o'clock. Yeah. She'd wake up at twelve one. You know, I'd get back and <laughs> yeah, spend my time with her. You know, yeah, and then, you know, and then the same thing would happen Saturday Sunday. You know, uh, uh, but um, yeah, as I was going to say, your know, dad said to me, you know, "Do you see uh, you know, a good living in this?" You know, so he clearly wanted to get her married off to me. Yeah, and I never get you know saying to him. Yeah, I think I'm uh, milking it. I can't see more than six grand a year in it because I can't think of anything else uh, that we need. <laughs> yeah, mad. Yeah, so and that was early eighties. Yeah, early eighties. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Well, so I didn't think there was a living in it. So <laughs> moving on to, you might have been a bit wrong with that one. Moving on to um, at the end of Silver after Silver End. Mm. Okay, because we'll save that for another chapter. What? Where did you move on? Did you move on to the Colne Valley at that point? Or not quite? Not quite. I um This is this is when the tackle kicked off. Yeah. Because I'd know where to fish. Um I think it started with Henry without me realising it. Mm. Um I'd gone from a carp angler to only wanted to catch the biggest a specimen hunt, if you like. Yeah. yeah, and I had Henry. I've been you know hunting Henry. Finally caught it. Yeah, and then and then I think the moment, like I said, the moment I got a sniff of a bigger one, 
even though I was having the you know, some of the best fishing in my life. Yeah, you know, you'd I was off. Yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, and after you know, catching the seal, being big one, I was, you know, I had no home. You know, I've often said to the kids, you know, you know, you know, have you got another ticket lined up? And they say no. I say, well, you know, the moment you catch that carp, you're targeting. You ain't gonna have a home. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I, I learned that. You know, have the next water lined up. And I just, in essence, wandered around aimlessly for two, three years. Right. Um, just fishing for the sake of it. Yeah, you know, I remember I'd start an opening night and then probably in two, three sessions, you know, I just didn't want to go anymore. Yeah. But what it did do, um, it enabled me to uh, have less balls in the air so I could focus on the business. Sure. Yeah, you know, as well as, you know, give the, give the girl some time, you know. Uh, so... That is when the business uh, uh, really kicked off, and I started sending more, sending more and more shots. The trouble is, I'm just kidding myself, you know, because I'm holding down a full time job. Yeah. With a um, spiraling tackle business. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it takes courage to chuck in your day job. Yeah. You know, and go, you know, go full time and follow your dream or your ambition. Yeah. You know, when you've got expenses like mortgages or families it really does take time yeah i was lucky that i didn't have a, a family or a wife at the time yeah. yeah otherwise you know it probably would have never happened yeah circumstances yeah. allowed it to yeah, some extent yeah. didn't they like i said when i saw hazel 25 years later i gave, gave a big kiss and said thanks you bitch for leaving me <laughs> <laughs> what a greeting yeah. but, but um that that time there so you've talked about pursuing your dreams you've talked about the big call it is to give it engineering or, or, or that sort of stable work if you like and you said to to the current missus at the times father that you didn't see more than six grand in it mm. two questions i've got for you one did you ever did you ever sort of embrace fishing as a career because obviously fishing for yourself and catching biggins and then a career in producing fishing uh, tackle are two completely different things they might be in the same sector but they are different and and time wise you thinking about that actually detracting from the amount of time you can fish. How did that all play out in your head? You've got to, you've got to remember then that you know, we were passionate anglers yeah. and that's all we were. Yeah. You know, and all we we're trying to do is really fund our lives to go fishing yeah. Yeah, and do the, you know, the other stuff you have to do, like you know, have, you know, have a house, a mortgage, you know, a family or whatever. Yeah, But ultimately... All we thought about every hour of the day was carp. Yeah. You know, and you know, you had this pioneering time yeah. uh, of like minded people uh, you know, emerging. Uh, but also, um, we wanted to, I think, spread that, that, right. that passion we had. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'd travel around the country. Um, doing talks, uh, uh, and that would also uh, give me an opportunity to sell me me wares. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You know, so yeah, so we are passionate anglers, um, passionate about our sport and socialising and wanting to talk to others. Yeah, and also trying to supplement a living to go fishing. Yeah, and that was simple. That yeah, and. There's a complete different uh, philosophy there to what then happened uh, later on, specifically in the 90s, where after, if you like, we've created this market mm. and the market has naturally exploded. Um, you know, the explosion was caused by three things. Number one, all the carp that have been stocked around the country are now in a sufficient numbers and sufficient size to interest many others yeah. to go after them. Yeah. And the fact, you know, the main thing needs to be with sufficient numbers. Yeah. Number two, the baits were really kept secret. Uh, and apart from that, you had to have such a passion to you know, make wanting to mix bait, make bait, yeah. you know, and be a nutritionist. You know, it's all part of it. You know? Yeah. And uh, most people couldn't be asked. So when... Uh, the uh, the so called barley, if you like, become available yeah. around ball in a bag. Yeah, the lazy man's you know, way in, 
Uh, that was a massive step you know, yeah. via Richworth. And the third uh, point was the hair rig. And you can't, yeah, you can't understate that. Yeah, um, we was really pissed off when the hair rig got out. How did that get out in your eyes? I mean, I've heard about three different versions. I think about how that was actually leaked to what is the increase in masses, but from memory, yeah. Could be corrected here, but I've never been asked that question. I'm really delving back into the old memory cells, which aren't what they were. Apologies, mate. From memory, a guy blew it, a kind of semi kind of ish knowing end. I'm not being unkind of it, but the type that no ability, no mm. reputation, they just try and you know, uh, have their odd moment of glory. Yeah. yeah? Uh, wrote about it in a, a magazine called Call Sangler. Right. Um, and blew it. Yeah, uh, and all I know is we was pissed, you know, because it was such a leveller. Yeah, it was an incredible leveller, you know. So an angler now, all he had to do was find a walk with carp in it, yeah. go into a tackle shop, buy a bag of bodies, yeah, yeah, yeah stick them on her hair, and Bob's <laughs> your uncle. Yeah, if the carp had, if the lake had sufficient numbers that you know, location wasn't watercraft wasn't, you know, uh, yeah, uh, the only way you'll catch them, and then. It was watercraft wasn't as important then. Yeah. I know it might sound daft, yeah. you know, but when uh, you've got naive carp, yeah, you haven't got the pressure. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, mu- yeah they're, they're, they can be mugged. You know, so you've got these anglers who no fuck all. We had no regard for. Them. They walked into it yesterday and they're catching as many carp as us. Yeah, nearly. complete yeah. game. Yeah. We didn't like it. I admit we didn't like it. No. You know, um, sorry, was that the, all the question or part of the question? Yeah, no, 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 no. The, 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 yeah, you, you done, you've done well on that. That's, that's, that's the whole question. In terms of, we've talked about your angling there. So you're, you, you said you're juggling a little less, but you're also still, I'm guessing, in terms of supply and tackle and business side of stuff, you're travelling around the country, you're doing talks, you're selling stuff. So that's ramping up to extent. Was there ever a point where you were struggling to balance the amount of work you were having to do in relation to the amount of fishing you could do because you said there it's all about essentially funding your fishing was there ever a balance point where you thought oh, i'll tell you what like it's so popular that i'm working most of the impossible. time I'm not getting on the bank it was impossible yeah um you know this is this is my week if you like yeah i get I get up on monday mm. uh go to the engineering which is 7 30 in the morning uh at 10 o'clock we had a Four-hour tea break. There was a post office literally two, three minutes away. I would roar up to the post office, <coughs> uh, put my parcels in, stamp them, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, sorry, I've got this wrong. No, sorry, there was only 15 minutes, right? I would roar home and get me post. Yeah. Right, because I only lived five minutes away, okay? Then we had half hour for dinner. Yeah. Right. In between the the morning lunch break and dinner time, I've opened all my post. Right? So checks and an order for carp yeah, sack. Yeah. I've post processed all them, you know, filled in uh, my bank painting book and all my checks, right? So at lunchtime, I'd roll up the post office because in my motor, I've got the parcels I've already packed. Yep. Right? I'd put the stamps on them and put them in the post system. i then shoot to the bank and put my painting yeah. book in with all my checks for my orders, right? I'd then finish at five. I'd go home. On the doorstep would be several school kids. These are my packers. Remember, <laughs> yeah, my yeah. house is my factory. Yeah, of course stuff. it is, yeah. yeah. Got no wife to worry. You know, this is why I said you could never have done it no, you yeah. know, with a wife. She would have said, fuck, if you don't fuck this off, I'm fucking you off, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'd let the boys in. <clears throat> they start packing the sacks. And making up the parcels. Meanwhile, I would go out in the garage where I had a cutting table and cut up all the fabric. Yeah. I would then, I had about, at this time, 10, 15 out workers, machinists. Wow. So I would go around their houses, deliver the work, pick up what they'd done. Yeah. I'd get back about 11 at night, um, make up my orders, Yeah. pass parcel them. And by this time, it would be like one, two o'clock in Mad. the morning. You know, and I don't know about you, but I get past the point of eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and you know, um, I'd go to bed. Um, I had a lodger, a guy called Nigel Dennis, really good carp angler. Again, one of the youngest ones to get in the BCC from Bristol. Um, 
he come to live with me, uh, he got kind of in a little bit of a scrape in Bristol. Mm. Um, Sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I can't. No, no, this is too dangerous. But, you, let's but, not incriminate people. <laughs> but um, let's just say another car panger tried to kill him. Wow. Over another individual. We'll leave it at that. Um, so he, he moved over to Essex. You would move if someone's trying to kill you. Yeah, and he was a McVitie's biscuit salesman. Right. Well, how that worked, he didn't have to go to supermarkets and try and send them biscuits. Uh, that's already all done. Uh, they used to vi- go to the supermarket and try and persuade the manager to give them the star you know, places to... To put them, yeah. Point us out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for example, I don't know whether you know, if you go a run of biscuits, yeah, right, and you know at the end of the run there could be a stack. Yeah. yeah? That stack, Prime. biscuits can sell 50 times yeah. more than being left on the shelf. Yeah. So that's what his job. And so McVitie's would drop him off biscuits uh, every week. Uh, to um, tempt the uh, the shop manager or allow him to say, look, can I just try building a stack and see how it goes? Yeah. yeah. So we used to have 10 boxes of, I think, 36 packets of McFitties digesters come every week. <laughs> nice. And that's what I was living on. Yeah, was it? Mm. No way. I, I could eat 10 packets of digesters a day because I wasn't cooking. Big up Dige- McVitties. Yeah. They've kept you going. Mm. But <laughs> 10 packets of digesters. I Unbelievable. Because all the work and all that, so I thought, I just, you know, really was beginning to have no energy. Yeah. You know, and feeling like really tired and sometimes I'd be really lightheaded. Right. So yeah. I went to the doctors, you know, and he told him, he sat me down, blah, blah, checked me pulse, everything, weighed me. And he said, um, Mr. Nash, what have you been doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you are on the thin side. Yeah. So I explain, you know, I've been working hard, you know, so uh, yeah, working hard, you know, not to be honest, mate, eating properly, been living on biscuits. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Nash, you know, he said, I need to tell you, you are only eight stone. Eight if you, stone? If you carry on like this, you're going to die. Jeez. So, you know, how thick can you be? You know, I should have worked that one out myself, shouldn't I? Anyway, <clears throat> so now I've got a problem. You know, I've got yeah. this burgeoning tackle business, but... I don't know if it can be a success. You know, it's, I have to say, I'm not just doing sacks now. Uh, I'm doing um, what we call side wraps. Um, yeah. with, this is a time when new body have come out that want to tilt. Yeah. So we, I was making wraps that would go around the sides. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was big business for me uh, as well. You know, so uh, was there anything? No, I think that's about it. So I was doing well out of that. Yeah. So sack slings. Flavours are going berserk, blah, blah. Um, and I didn't kind of want to give it up because I could see the potential. Yeah. But, you know, um, you know I couldn't... It's uh, health, isn't it? Yeah, it's I you. couldn't live without yeah. the mortgage money, you know. Yeah. Uh, even though I had a, a, a supplementing it. Uh, but no, that's wrong, actually. I was doing all right now. I just yeah. realised, yeah. Yeah. I had, um, I had two lodges. Right. Um. I was on, yeah, I just remembered. I was on serious money. This is why I didn't want to give up the engineering. I was on serious money. Yeah. I was on, um, I was bloody good. And yeah. I was on a, what they call piece work, where you get so many hours to do a job. Okay. Well, I ended up, I ended up running three different machines. So you know, one guy would have run a machine a week. Right? I won't yeah. bore you with a story, but yeah, through the various, um, types of machine i could run three machines on my own so i'm doing the work of three wow. men right plus i was uh, cutting the jobs in half yeah so uh, i was doing 120 uh, hours work a week wow. and getting 60 hours bonus yeah so i was on serious money yeah you know, probably equivalent nowadays of i don't know 100 grand say yeah decent you know? plus i've got two lodges yeah yeah i'm having i'm I'm having the time of my life going out clubbing or whatever. Yeah. You know, um, I've finished with Linda by now. Right. Another okay. rich bird. Yeah. So I'm out. I'm out. I'm out spending probably the average adult's wages you know, uh, just on me clubbing. Yeah. Blinking you know, out. Um, I bet that was one hell of a scene. If you're blowing that much money, like around like young like lads and young ladies, mate, mate go forward just a bit. You know, <laughs> when I did. Um, uh, 
I'll give up work. I'll tell you that story in a minute. Yeah. Oh, it was the best summer of my life. <laughs> well, 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 one of them. The hair was another, but it was one of the best summers of your life because I had enough work, but I didn't really have that much. So I'd finish around 12, 1 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, and again, all I could, all you ever remember then was you know the lovely hot summers. Yeah, and all I remember that's lovely hot summer. So I finished around one o'clock, and I'd go down the beach, Thorpe Bay Beach. Right. right? Well, Thorpe Bay Beach would be uh, brimming with young, drop dead, gorgeous you know, women. This is a posh part of South End. Yeah, <laughs> with the little toddlers. Yeah, all who. Uh, either hated or were frustrated with their husbands who worked in the city and never come home to eight, ten o'clock at night knackered. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. And yeah, I have always loved kids, you know, and I gave the little uh, the cuds, the kids a bit of time, and they all loved me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So no. I've got these women all over me. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, fish yeah. in a stock pond, Kev. Yeah, yeah, I've got to put, I've got to put uh, baby Joe to bed in an hour or two, in an hour. Why don't you come back and I'll make oh. you some tea? Wink, wink. God. Oh, God, it was an awesome summer, mate. <laughs> I wore it out. Sounds but, busy, mate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, where was I? So, um, the year before, I'd got caught up in a lathe at work. Me, uh, me over got caught up in Oof. it. And uh, I, was, I was lucky uh, that I lived. Yeah. Okay. Um, I won't bore you with it or how. But Don't sound boring, mate. You, 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 if you get caught up, mate, and you get through it, there's not much yeah, chance you're yeah, coming out. Yeah, in, in getting through it, um, I... Had to brace, well, basically, on a lathe, yeah. you've got a permanently, or used to have, a permanently revolving screw, yeah. you know, basically by your waist. Yeah. And then you've got this, what's called the saddle on the bed, which you engage into the screw, and that's what makes it go along with the cutter on it and cut the metal. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got my oval wrapped around the screw, <sighs> and on the saddle, you had the emergency um, a lot of lever, lever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, then a bar on the floor that you could also... Uh, that would break, break, that yeah. would stop the machine. Yeah, but that was connected to the lever, right? right? The lever's pulled in me gut. Oh. I'm stamping on the brake, but yeah. it can't. The lever can't go down because it's in me gut, oh. and I'm getting dragged in this machine. I've got a lump of metal this big, gun dong, 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 and my face is going to. I braced against the bed, screamed uh, at the top of me voice, yeah. and split the oval right down, and then it was pulled off me. But in doing so, I massively um, sprained my back and yeah, yeah. Uh, bruised and cracked a uh, couple of ribs. And ended up having uh, six weeks off work. Yeah. Uh, I played on it so I could go fishing. Yeah. So a year later, I'm in this dilemma. I'm working myself into the ground, mm. but yeah, I don't want to give up yeah. the great... Uh, amount of money I'm getting from the job and the lifestyle unless I really feel that you know happy hooker tackle yeah, the potential can work there. yeah you know? but yeah you know, that was where I really want you know it wasn't work yeah you know, I hated the engineering yeah you know, I used to look at the clock be 10 o'clock I'd look at it three hours later be 10 15 <laughs> yeah you know, you know, you know, yeah I guess a lot of men are like that and I think that is one of the reasons I was so passionate about carp fishing it was just you know, my escape from, you know, the hundum of engineering. Yeah, you know? yeah. So anyway, I faked the accident again. <laughs> you faked it? Yeah, but, yeah, did exactly the same, but I know how to fake it now. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Did exactly the same with the view, right, I'll have six weeks off work and see if there's enough work to make it. Right, so this is a sort of a, a trial run before you give a up. trial run, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I didn't have the bowl, yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, inherently a, a very honest person you know so yeah. i've got a massive guilty conscience you know i've had to ring him once a week and every time i'm ringing him, i'm thinking he don't believe me he don't believe yeah, me yeah, yeah. so after like three weeks into it i've gone in my bait cupboard i've got out some yellow dye and some black dye and i've like painted myself and it looked in the well, like a bruise no, bruise i did a fucking good job <laughs> anyway i've popped into work you know rick was the owner and I, you know, I could just see it. Well, I, I probably imagined it, but you know, I said, oh, look at this. Room. He went, fuck, I was stunned at you. <laughs> he said, you better sit down. Yeah, utterly convincing. <laughs> but, yeah, anyway, um, yeah, a week later, I just rang Rick up and said, Rick, you know, I just don't think I can handle engineering anymore. Yeah. What was his reaction to that? Because you, you, as you said, you were a prime employee there. You were doing a, an awful lot of work. Economy-wise, you were doing like three blokes work in a week. It's a good point, you know. And you know, it's Bob that got me in this uh, factory. Yeah. Um, he's working there, and um, as you say, uh, you know, um, 
I was doing the work of three men. Bob was doing the work of two. So yeah. if nothing else, they were saving all the money, national health contribution. Yeah. yeah. And I was their star. You know, uh, yeah. So yeah. So when I left, you know, they, they they had to take on I guess two more blokes. You yeah. know, you know, to keep uh, to, uh, uh, instead of me. You know. So it's a good point. But um, yeah. And as I say, the rest is history. I was overwhelmed with work. Really. Yeah. Well, I was, I was overwhelmed. I got more than enough work to supplement um, my amazing lifestyle. You know, yeah. s- uh, summer. Bachelorhood, I told you about Fort Bay and all that. <laughs> the summer of Bachelorhood. Pay me, pay me mortgage and everything, you know, and uh, it's all I wanted to do, to be honest. Um, there wasn't a lot of fishing in my head, yeah. you know, so, you know, because um, I'd lost my way, I had nowhere to go. Yeah. Yeah, and then suddenly, out of the blue, um, I heard of this, well, what happened was, we're talking a lake called Snake Pit. Yeah. I'm going to gloss over this. That's another chapter, uh, mate. Well, because I know it's a huge, long story. So, mate, I've never told the whole story. I've touched on, I think, the earlier podcast I did. But, but basically, um, again, coincidences. When I was at Leia, um, got friendly with a local who was a, a vermin control officer. Basically, he travelled around uh, Essex dealing with rat infestations or whatever. Yeah. Yeah? And he told me that he'd seen... A uh, huge, a huge carp in a lake at Silver End, mm. right? The pit, yeah. Okay, I knew it. Like I said, I used to go up there as a kid. Yeah. Okay, so I drove up there one day and checked it out, and all I saw was about eight and or ten commons, like wildies. Yeah, know, cricket bat commons. Yeah, 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 five, six pounds thin. That's all I yeah. saw. You know, and you know what? I never caught those, by the way. Did when you I was not? on it, when I was on it, I never saw them either. Yeah. But that's all I saw. So I dismissed it. He'd also told me about a lake called Donnylands, right, in Colchester, where he swore there was much bigger carp than what there was in Layer. You know, Layer's like, yeah. remember, got you know, 30, 30 yeah, yeah. You know, the biggest carp we know. Much was, bigger than that. Yeah. So because. I thought he was talking about bollocks about Silver End. Yeah, I ignored it. Yeah, 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 and then Silver End come reality. So it was always in my head about this Donnylands. You know, I've got nowhere to fish. Yeah, um, I told Bill about it. So over say three four years, we both popped in occasionally, looked at it. I remember looking around at Stuart Demon. Actually, I told Stuart Demon yeah. about it. Or he also heard a story from the rat guy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when you know, he told me, mate, mate, I met at um, Culture. We looked at it together. We never saw a sign of a fish. Really? Anyway, I've got nowhere to go. You know, just nowhere I fancy. There's a water around the corner down the road called the Garrison, mm. which uh, had a 30 in it yep. by this time. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's something really to go yeah, at. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so, you know, okay, it's not... You know, it's just low 30, but yeah, yeah, a 30 is still a monster. Yeah. Um, What's your PB at the time here now? Are you Have you had a 30 at this time? No, no. No. No, no, it's still um, Henry. Still Henry. Um, so, sorry, yeah, yeah. Me, yeah, me, s- yeah, of course. You know what my yes, PB is? It's significantly gone up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we've I've saved caught, up I've caught the, the silver end big one, haven't I? Uh, so yeah, so now you know, I'm really looking for something that could match that. And as I mm. said, you know, there was nothing. I didn't want to go backwards. No. Yeah. You know, so yeah. You know, so uh, you know, that's why, uh, by happy coincidence, that if you like, that black hole helped me get the business off the ground. Yeah. 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 And then uh, I hear about the big common snake pit. Mm. A rumor. Sorry. So I'm sorry about the rumor. This being sorry. Rumour there being big fish in the snake bit, as yeah. I said. Never saw a yeah, thing yeah, in there. Yeah. So what I decided to do was hit the garrison because it had a 30 in it, yeah. right? And as I was driving past Donnylands, yeah. I would bait that as well. Yeah. And what I was thinking was every couple of weeks, I'd do the Friday night on Donnylands, and if I blanked, then move back on the garrison yeah. you know, for the weekend, the rest of the weekend, the Saturday night through the Sunday. And and one night in the week, yeah. So I've baited it. I I didn't do the start on the garrison because I knew it'd be full. I do used to fish it. Um, 
Damien Clark. Yeah. And, and he's Herbert, you know, and this is when he's, what, 16-year-old kid yeah. or whatever. Um, I knew Damien then. Um, so anyway, I turned up at the uh, garrison to do my first session. Yeah. And I think it was Damien. He said, have you heard about Donnie? I said, no. I said, what? He's, I can't remember the guy's name. It was an ice cream, drove an ice cream van, this lad. Right. No, so I'd missed a bit. I'd turned up at Donnie and bait up. Yeah. And I saw a bivvy on the far bank. Mm. And a bloke standing outside it. I walked round, and as I walked round, he saw me. He shot in his bivvy. And when I got to his bivvy, he's even zipped the door up. Wow. I thought, you are sociable. Yeah. Anyway, I got to take it, and uh, Damien said to me, that this guy uh, has had, I think he had four carp, including uh, this monster common. Um. Forty pound, couldn't believe it. Blew me away, blew me away. But not on your bait. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, all these years I've been looking at, it, never seen, never a seen car. it. Yeah. And uh, so I just turned round and went straight back up there. And when I went, got up there, actually, that bloke had gone. I never saw him again. Really? He actually committed suicide after that. You know. You joke. No, next week it was on. It was on my bait. The next week I had his dad on the phone. Saying, "Oh, my son just caught you know the biggest common in the uh, you know England, blah blah." Yeah, because uh, I think it was at the time. I think yeah. this fish had died. Um, you know what you're gonna you know, give us? You know because he called it on your bait, blah blah, on your flavours, whatever. You know, I said, "Well, I'm not giving you nothing." Yeah, yeah. Think, you know, he should just be honest and say what he caught it on. Oh, so he hadn't said what he caught it on. Well, he hadn't. He reported it. Yeah, you know, okay. he, you know, he's threatening to report it on someone else's bait. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In those days. You know, so I told him to bugger off. Anyway, yeah, he committed suicide in the end. He committed suicide? Yeah. yeah uh, what, just probably because I refused to give him any money for his... I, d- I, don't, <laughs> I don't reckon you can take blame for that one. That's not great, is it? No. So I moved on the snake pit and, uh, yeah, it was, um, the problem I had, yeah, we was probably fishing for four or five fish. Mm. Immensely hard. It was, um, I would estimate, eight, ten acres at a time because it did shrink. It's been backfilled, but... If it's, say, 10 acres, um, because it's been backfilled, the level had risen. Yeah. R- originally, it had islands in it, right? So as the level rose, it flooded the islands. Mm. So out of the 10 acres, probably two acres maybe, uh, were submerged islands covered in bushes. Yeah. Uh, and the other eight acres, probably seven and a half of that, was thick weed. Yeah. You know, so we're, we're looking for a needle in a haystack here. Yeah, you know, that first season was a real struggle. If not, and then also, you know, all the names arrived. Phil I was going to say, yeah, Phil, uh, Phil Harper arrived. You yeah. know, um, I haven't mentioned Phil. Phil been a, a friend for years. You know, I first met him at. Um, well, I first met him. I fished a little water in Malden when I was still in Rayleigh Angling Club mm-hmm. uh, um, for a couple of weekends. Yeah, with uh, you know, with me um, specials and that. Yeah. Uh, and it was called the Railway Pond. There was an arc on it in the middle of the Angler's Mail. It had carp in it. You know, again, similar size to the Radio Angler Club. Yeah. Max a little bit bigger, ten pound. And I fished that, and Phil Harper turned up on his push bike, but dressed like a, a greaser with his ta- tasseled leather jacket and everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, where's your motorbike, Phil? When well, he wow. weren't old enough, you know. And that's how we, we you know, we've kept in touch uh, you know, ever since. You know, his dear friend. Yeah. Yeah. Long, long time. I think he's given up fishing now. You know, until he gave up fishing. Yeah, but um, yeah, he moved on there. Um, Zenon moved on. Yeah. Uh, next season mailing and that, that lot or later wow. on mailing but anyway the problem, bait, yeah. problem I got is that I've been um, contracted by the Angling Times to write a series with Rod Hutchison we called it uh, Nashie and Hutch Starsky yeah. and Hutch yeah nice yeah we called it Nashie and Hutch but I'm on a lake where yeah uh, you know, Rod had said to me you know, this is fucking ridiculous you know you need to be catching <laughs> carp yeah 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 but, I couldn't give it up because of the size of the fish, but I was on there one day and there was a guy sitting there uh, on a chair uh, reading the book, right? Right. Are you serious, mate? Yeah, you're on this ball breaker lake where you know, there's four fish amongst the jungle of weed and trees, yeah, and you're reading a bloody book yeah. instead of having your eyes glued on the water. That's what I thought, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I wouldn't 
this him or tell him that, but I got talking to him and <coughs> he told me he'd been fishing a lake at Harefield, right, yeah. um, previous year. Uh, and he got out this thick wad of fish he caught. Wow. Right? He explained to me there was a, a bit called the workings. He just used to uh, go out in the workings, chuck his rods in the margin, yeah, and just read a book all day. Yeah, and he caught <laughs> cool loads of doubles yeah. to over 30. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, and this is my answer to the Angling Times column. Yeah, right? of course it is. So... I told uh, Zenon, Phil, mm. uh, so we all decided to pull off and uh, fish. Airfield. Airfield. Yeah. Uh, There's another reason we decided to fish Airfield, but I'll tell you that if I would tell you the story there. Because Donnie Lens, we renamed the snake bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I renamed it. Uh, but it's, yeah, so we went to Airfield. Uh, trouble was, we was a season or two too late. Um, some names have been there. One, yeah. one uh, called uh, Loftus. Good old Bernie. Bernie. Good old Bernie Loftus, a well-known North, Northern angler. Yeah, he'd smashed it. Yeah, uh, and yeah, because the carp were naive again. You know, you know, yeah, yeah, been opened by a boy of leisure. Um, yeah, you know, the carp were naive. You know, which is why this guy on the um, had caught so many reading his book. Many, you know, even though you know he put up no effort or and any ability. So we kind of turned up when word had got out, and every young gun, yeah, carp angling in, the, in England who uh, you know had any rep or any ability was on there. Yeah, simple as that. Yeah. You know. What was your first impression of Airfield when you got there? Honestly, yeah. Go on. I was daunted. Yeah. And out of my depth. Yeah. Um, one, it was the biggest yeah. lake I'd ever fished. Um, two, the way they were fishing it, um, rods up high. Mm-hmm. You could see, you know, the one, there's one bank it's out the two, uh, which is called the Causeway, and it's really high above the water. Uh, from memory, maybe mm. maybe ten foot. Yeah. yeah. So you see the lines going out, you know, for yeah, miles, miles. You know, tight lines. You know, further than I'd ever dreamed of casting. You know, uh, yeah. I I went there with um, me standard two and a quarter rods. Mm. Uh, we used to. We had little tiny spooled reels. Yeah. This was the first bait runner called the Triton C spin. You know, little tiny spooled reels. Um, I was used to fishing up close and personal in Essex, you know, with the exception of Leia, which when I fished Leia, well, I guess Leia's maybe 15, 20 acres, a long time since I've seen it. But when I fished that, that was all um, uh, margin work for me because, yep. you know, I was fishing parks and they was all used to use the margin shelf. Nigel Dennis and Bill went on it at one point, by the way, and did really well at range. But right. I never fished. I'd never fished long range. No. Basically, Harefield had three bars. Um, I think they dug those signed type of gravel pits by attracting, attaching uh, rafts with um, diggers on on them uh, to the bottom, if you like, which is, you know, in essence, hadn't been dug out. So yeah. you know, water just below the surface or the surface. And then they would dig a channel yeah yeah and so uh you ended up with these ridges yeah. uh bars effectively went more or less the whole length of hair or, or two thirds three quarters away yeah um and there's three of them from memory one was about 50 40 50 yards out depending where it was yeah the next one was 80 90 and the third one was 100 plus maybe 110 120 yeah okay um not only did the bars come very near the surface, so there could have been 10 foot of water mm. back of them or front, but they were also covered in real sharp flints yeah. and swan mussels. Wow. So uh, you know, I used to say once I sussed it that if you cast over uh, the first bar, 
you may say land six or seven in ten yeah. uh, takes. If you cast over the second bar, you may land two, <laughs> less three. and less. Yeah. If you card, uh, cast over the furthest bar, yeah, you might get one out of ten. Yeah, it was it was lethal. You know, uh, you know, anglers were uh, making traces out hundred pound mono. I even heard <sighs> some were using steel trace wire. Really? But whatever you used, you know, the flints were like razors, you know, you get cut through. Um, yeah, I'd never experienced anything like it. Um, I'd never fished at that range. You know, they was all using, uh, you know, to get out there, they was all using eight pound line. Yeah. So, you know, so the rods weren't as good as they late would become. But the most important thing was the reels, uh, you know, were went up to it uh, yeah. so they were trying to get out to him with an 8 pound line as well <laughs> yeah, so as soon as the 8 pound line was touching a flint ding because yeah. you know, they're getting cut back behind the leaders um, so that first weekend I was really daunted um, Yeah, I think I'd fish one swim try to um, cast out whack them out but I just couldn't get the range I didn't know how to no you know um, Lucky, uh, <laughs> I moved. I never forget. I moved really disillusioned to do me last night, Saturday night, uh, and I thought I'm going to fish how I know best. And that's, by the way, one of the big lessons I've you know, had through life. And I always tell lads, you know, then when they say they're moving on to a new water, I say fish how you know, you know best. Yeah, the mistake I made at Harefield on that first session. Uh, and for a little while after was I was intimidated by mm. the other anglers. You know, oh, yeah, I need to be fishing like them. Yeah. yeah there won't be any other way Yeah, uh, than fishing like them. Yeah, It's the same old story. If you fish like everybody else, you catch the same as everyone else. Yeah. You, you, you know, you know, life, mankind and whatever, innovation can only uh, go forward if, you, you know, if you're an individual and do yeah. your own thing yeah. rather than follow the sheep. So uh, that Saturday night... Um, I decided to fish the, you know, the short bar. Yeah. I never saw any sign of fish, by the way. Uh, but then I did see uh, one bubble. Uh, I think it was on the left hand side, between or whatever, by the first bar. And to my utter astonishment, I got a take. No way. Couldn't believe it. Got a take. Uh, but I lost it. Uh, not a cut off or a hook pull or? Um, can't remember. I think it was a hook pull. Uh, right. But I lost it. But do you know what? Yeah. That convinced me I could catch him. Yeah. I think if I hadn't got that take, I would have never gone back. You pulled off, you reckon? I would have never gone back. Yeah. You know, I would have said, it, you know, I can't do this sort of fishing. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, if you like, that one lost car was the start of <laughs> the madness. <laughs> I remember the madness is a great point. I remember, I've, I've, there's so much writing with regards to Harefield. Yourself, the likes of Rob Malin, etc. How challenging the fishing was, which we've sort of conceptualised, but also how mad the old party scene was. What was that like in that sort of, um, yeah, in that time on there? You know, I was talking about eras, you know, and all that. Yeah. You know, um, you'll never, ever have that era again, just like you'll never have the rock yeah. you know, music or the clove era, you know, or or the fishing. You know, it, was, it was just... All the stars aligned, yeah. You know, if you like, um, you've got Savvy uh, on one side of uh, the road, yeah, and next to it, uh, rather handily, a pub, <laughs> yeah? yeah. Opposite the pub on the other side of the road, you've got Harefield. <laughs> um, everybody wanted to be on Savvy. That was a magnet, yeah, for the Calm Valley, uh, especially with the writings of Rod Hutchinson. Uh, etc. Uh, but it was um, becoming like an old you know, a, a syndicate you was never going to get in. Yeah, dead man's uh, shoes. Dead man's shoes, you know, unless your face fit. Uh, mine certainly didn't. Um, I was actually in the horse and barge one night when I heard Brox up say, Nashie would never get on my lake. Really? Yeah, yeah. That might have been um, because of Rod. Um, yeah. I just digress a bit, you know. Um, me and Rod had had a very public... You know, Rod had asked me to um, take uh, a 50% share in his business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
um, simple. Yeah. All Rod wanted to do go fishing, as I said. You yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. The difference between us and you know, uh, what happened later, uh, we went fishing. Sorry, we were we worked in fishing to fund our fishing and our passion. You know, uh, Lockie, you know, that's why I got such a great uh, respect for Solon and Lockie. Yeah. You know, he was of that type. Rod Hodges and me. And either it has to be said, uh, Dietrich, um, mm-hmm. who formed uh, along with Bob Baker, um, um, Richworth. Richworth, yeah, yeah, yeah. He might have been right rogue, but, you know, we all, you know, you know. The same ilk. Did it, you know, because our passion, you know, and love the sport and Follow, promote the word. You know, yeah. You know, it's only when we've done all the graft and you know, so the other things come together. I think I'll start talking about this earlier and probably uh, lost me way. You know, that suddenly the masses started mm. getting into it. That yeah. uh, others looked at it as, um, wow, we can make a load of dough out of this. You yeah. Know, you know, yeah. Cliff Fox, Fox, you know, Fairbrass, Calder. It's two examples. Yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, where was that going? Um, you were um, you were told that you weren't ever going to get on. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Rod had um, asked me to take a fifty cent stake yeah. in his business, basically to save it from going bust, mm. and I did. But the financial restraints I had to put in place to save it, i.e., I really uh, cut down on his lifestyle. Yeah, uh, he didn't like. And when I turned it round, um, uh, he wanted his business back. Okay. Well, I had so much loyalty from the staff. In, you know, massive effort and work in trying to turn it round. Mm. Um, I felt I should give them the choice of whether they you know, wanted me to fight for the business or give it back to the world. Frankly, I'd had a gut for a rod. You know, um, love, love, love the man to bits, but not when it comes to going into business. To right? work, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, nightmare. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get rid of it, you know, and uh, walk away. Yeah. Anyway, I rang up. This is when Gary Bays was foreman of catch him and I told him the situation and he said well can you give me a half an hour to talk to everyone yeah. and come back and said if you walk we all walk and I really? thought you bastard yeah. so kind of that yeah. forced me uh, to get into this power struggle with Rod yeah, yeah. Uh, the end result it was the company was split up uh, we retained the title catch him mm. uh, Rod started again as Rod Hutchins and Products but then there's this huge confusion over you know, who owned what. Yeah, you know, you yeah. know, one of the classic products that was massive, and still is today, you know, it's the biggest fish catch of all time, is Scopex. Yeah. And Rod's saying, well, he's got the original, and we're saying we got we the got, original, yeah, yeah. which we did have. You know, when uh, I uh, went in with Rod, um, I approached the three companies responsible for the ingredients in... Um, Scopex and uh, did an exclusivity deal with him because it's so important. Yep. Yeah. So Rod, if you like, was telling uh, Porkies, but yeah, survival, innit? Yep. Anyway, Tim Paisley always, and indeed to this day, idolised Rod. Yeah. And he let Rod print a letter in the cart world, which was outrageous. You know, um, I couldn't let it go because mm. the number of inaccuracies in it and blatant lies. So I... Uh, responded and in essence thanks to Tim Paisley bless him our dirty washing was washed in public yeah Rod's loved in the Colm Valley yeah respected and affection from everyone the especially bar. on Savvy yeah. I've walked into the lion's <laughs> den and I yeah of course you have I'll never get the first uh, day I walked in there um, definitely frost, you, know, you almost had, like, had the Savvy contingent on one side of the yeah. and bars drinking as I walked in they all turned, looked at me, frosty faces, and turned round. You know, and it went all quiet. Yeah. I walked up to the bar. I'm really on my own, you know, in this you know, real hostile place. Yeah. Anyway, this bloke walked over, you know, built like a brick shit house door. You know, like three orangutans welded together <laughs> and stuck his hand there and said, Hi Kevin, I'm Dougal. Welcome oh, to the valley. The infamous Dougal. The infamous Dougal. Yeah, which has kind of sent a message. If I'm welcoming, you know, Nashy, yeah, you, know, you lot, you know, better start behaving. Yeah, you because know, Dougal, you know, it's just so infamous for, you know, yeah. his intimidation, his power. Yeah. And that kind of broke it. Yeah. You know, and so other people who really, you know, 
didn't want to take sides. No, know. but they're sort of almost forced to, aren't they? They're on the periphery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so that... That solved that point, a uh, little point. Um, and really, the horse and barge was the nucleus for everything that happened, <laughs> really. You know, you, know, you read Rod's book, yeah. it's mentioned regularly. You know, you know, there's two, two um, rotors that sat over there, originally yeah. called the Toads and the Loonies. You know, which roughly translated, the loonies had fun and got pissed every night. Yeah, and the toads with the boring farts who just stayed on the lake. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, that culture, that drink, that culture of mixing carp fishing and drinking, you know, was, yeah, you know, it was put in print if you like. You know, as a way yep. to go, and it could be said that um, it was followed up on. Then, you know, there's more to carp fishing than just um, sitting behind a rod to have some fun along the way. Yeah, uh, Roger Smith also. Well, it's Roger Smith actually who um, got me into drinking. I met him at Silver End for the first time some yeah. years before, and it was an opening week, and um, yeah, the, 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 the season's opened, and you know, he walked past me uh, at lunchtime uh, with. Um, hmm. I used to fish with a guy. Oh, God, I can't think what his name was. He, he, he died of alcoholic poisoning, funny enough. Are you joking? No, well-known angler, rod builder. Oh, Bob Jones. Oh, Bob, Bob yeah. No, not Bob Jones. There's two Bob Jones. This is Bob Jones, the rod builder. Um, he used to fish with him all the time. And, um, yeah, they walked around lunchtime, and Roger had a kind of distinctive, almost squeaky voice. He said, come on, Kevin, we're going up the pub. Said, what? what? What are you on about? It's, it's opening day, mate. <laughs> yeah. He's a cart fish. The car will still be there when we get back. Yeah, and so I felt kind of, if you like, obliged pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah, so I went out and had a couple of pints with him. But I always hated cooking on the bank. Yeah, and so I saw the benefits. You know, yeah, yeah, go and have a pint. You know, and um, have a wash and freshen up in the loose if you need to. Yeah, yeah, and have a and have a, a meal. Grub, yeah. yeah, and yeah, I've kind of done that all my life since. But um, <coughs> yeah, so. It was easy for me to get you know, the horse and barge because, as I said, uh, I could have something to eat. Uh, you know, and I did enjoy a pint at that time. But, yeah. But I also wanted to catch the car, you know, so, you know, I've gone up there a few times and, uh, you know, I'm beginning to rebel against it, if you like. No, you know, I need to catch some car. You know, it's so competitive. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, Awesome anglers on there. Yeah, yeah. And it was like all the young guns, you know, who effectively were going to struggle to get onto Harefield, onto Savvy, because they, you know, they had characters, you know. Yeah. They, was, you know, they weren't boring. You know, <laughs> no, yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Lot. With the exception of Rob. Rob was on there. Yeah. Um, and that didn't last long. Read his book. Yeah. You know, he uh, got chucked off, and that's when he came over to Harefield. Yeah. But, but it was all, dare I suggest, you know, boring farts uh, on there at the time. And so all the young guns, uh, you know, the wild ones, party animals, uh, were on Harefield and the pub's opposite. Plus, it had an awesome landlady called Shirley. Yeah. Who, well fit, who, uh, <laughs> who run it with only the um, get, uh, wait, uh, bar luck maids, no blokes. You know, and she, she and she loved the car pangers or else you know she understood where the money was. To she be knew made. where the money was coming yeah, from, mate, didn't she? Knew she? Where the money was coming from, yeah. And um, so it was a hot summer. Yeah, yeah. And despite whatever you know, my wheels were like, I'm going to fish this weekend. Yeah, you know, there's no but barrows then. You know, so I'd turn up. Yeah, you know, a lot of anglers were um, semi full time. Yeah, yeah. So I'd turn up. A lot of swims would be, most of the good swims would be taken, so I decided to start fishing the back back bank because it was basically not fished. Yeah. And I just knew they had to get down there. You know, but, you know, some of those, you know, so you're doing it in one walk. So it's what, I guess it was a 25, 20, 30, 20 minute walk, say, to the back bank. Yeah. yeah. I've got everything for a weekend on my back. <sighs> you know, yeah. And then I remember on some days it was so hot, and I'd get it on a Friday. One, two, three. I will make it. I used to be yeah. saying that. Yeah. That close season, before I went on the airfield, 
um, I trained with a mate. I basically did my SAS selection. I had a mate who was um, no trained, way. trained to get, get in the SAS. So you trained with him? I trained with him to get, you know, the, get my strength and stamina up for Harefield. <laughs> wow. And, you know, and so, you know, so you know, I was doing these long walks with all the uh, kit and doing it in one. But, yeah, you know, so I'd be walking past saying, oh, okay, have you come to the pub? No, oh, mate, I'm no. fishing this weekend. My mate kind of, by the time I got to the back, back yeah. I'm ringing, pub, fuck it. Throw <laughs> the gear down <laughs> get, and go up the uh Let's get pub. a cold beer. Yeah. Well, Dougal's on Harefield. Yeah. And he kind of influenced uh, your fishing or lack of it. Because, like, yeah, you know, when Dougal said, you did. You did it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, come at the pub tonight. Uh, Kev, you're yeah. all right, Dougal. Yeah, you know. So Friday, turn up, drop your gear off, maybe set your rods up, probably. You know. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes it didn't, but set your rods up and go with the horse and barge. Yeah. So uh, horse and barge will close, what was it, 11, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then Roger Smith will be in there, probably. Yeah. You know, Dougal, oh, let's go and have a curry. We've got the munchies. So you go into Harefield Town and have a curry. Right, so you wobble back onto the lake at two or whatever in the morning. Yeah. Just whack the rods out. You know that's where I think the phrase pub cast. Yeah, from. pub Because it was, could argue in some ways, simple fish. You just cast out, and you just pull back until you feel chink, chink, chink the light gravel. Yeah, and then you know you'd be on the bottom of the start oh, of the slug yeah. bars and just drop your rod. Yeah, so you do that. You wake up. Uh, Saturday morning to Dougal probably saying come out the calf yeah all right yeah. mate let me get me shit together yeah wind your rods in go up the hair fill calf yeah it's great breakfast um, the only downside of it is you might be staring at a bloke opposite who's you know one of the toad wrote on Savvy uh, with yeah. mushrooms yeah he's caught he's caught <laughs> yeah. Roger Roger put a law in place rule in place that um if you can only eat mushrooms, <laughs> if you all the mushrooms, yeah. if you caught. Right, so this bloke's got these beautiful, juicy mushrooms <laughs> that have been cooked in butter, and you have it anyway, for whatever. So you had your butt breakfast, it would then be 11, whatever, and the horse and barge is open for lunch. <laughs> so we go and have a, yeah. a few or more sherbets in the horse and barge till 3 o'clock, you go back, have a pub cast and have an afternoon siesta. Yeah. It's Saturday night, though. This is a big night in the halls and barge. Yeah. We even used to take a, a party clothes up with us. Yeah. yeah. We weren't mingers. We didn't walk in with all the smelly cart gear. Camo boys coming in. So you change into your, you know, your, your proper gear, yeah. yeah. After shave and whatever, and go up the halls and barge. Many ladies about the horse and barge, mate, or not? Apart from the, bar, the barmaids and, and Shirley. Barmaid Shirley and... A few of us had girlfriends. I had a girlfriend at the time who was coming up on Saturday night for the weekends. Essex John had a girlfriend. Um, <laughs> Come and meet us at the A couple of the other lads were um, having relationships with the barmaids. You, know, you see them um, coming out of bibbies on Sunday morning. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Walk of shame. Mm-hmm. Walk of shame. At the bank. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. It's an awful story, but um, I'll never forget it. Um, there's what was called the workings. It was the end bank yeah. nearest um, the horse and barge. Uh, and it basically was out of bounds because in a very short time, by the time I've arrived, um, uh, the, it's a working pit yeah. and they're pumping all the silt out, sand, you know, deposit, and uh, that, that end had really um, silted up. You know, where the guy yeah. I met at um, Snake book, Pit. Book reader. Yeah, yeah. Was fishing, you know, catch all these carp. It was now like foot deep mm. you know really silted up um but i got permission from john stent who run it from farlow's yeah uh, to um to fish it so i went on there for a weekend um after that i decided not to because i kind of thought you know, i caught one actually i'll tell you in a minute but i kind of thought it's i've, I'm a, I've got an advantage that none of the other members had and it wasn't fair. Okay, so it's just you that was able to fish just that area. Step and let me fish it. Right. You know, I was uncomfortable with it. You know, look yeah, at me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, so anyway, so I did this weekend. And it was red-hot night. Um, 
my girlfriends with me. We come back from the awesome barge, and um, uh, when you've had a drink and you're with your girlfriend, you ain't seen all week. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You know, game of Scrabble. Game of Scrabble. <laughs> yeah, and um, I've had a. T- Sorry, no. First thing that happened was there's this enormous loud music, as if as if someone's you know, put a 500 watt speaker next yeah. to me, Bivy. What the? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you know, real like rave music, you know, beat, you know, uh, beat music. And I got out, and what the hell? You know, all you can hear is just this amazing loud music. Yeah. And you couldn't sleep, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm had a few pints. You know, yeah. You know, I'm dancing on the banks. Living you know? the dream. And I looked <laughs> across, you know, uh, my mate who I met there, John Watson, we called him Essex John. Yeah. He's on the far bank as well. Yeah. Uh, um, he's dancing as well, you know, both, you know, so he, like, he also liked his drugs, so he's probably stoned as well. <laughs> and he's got his girlfriend with him. Anyway, eventually went to bed. And I've got a take. Um, it's six o'clock in the morning and I'm start bollock naked. And I've hooked this car and because it's so shallow, you know, the car's got like, like 20 yards away from me and yeah. I can't get any nearer. So I've waded out and netted it and then I couldn't move. Because you know, I'm stuck in the mud. Yeah, you, yeah. So it's like just above my knees and I can't bloody move, you know. And it's six o'clock in the morning and the bank Johnny's on is called Causeway, which is also a public footpath. Oh, you know? no. And there's people dog walking and me standing in the middle of the airfield with bollocks hanging. You know, anyway. Li- oh, my. Shouting my head off to um, Essex. Oh, John. Know? Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> get my bird to wake up. She used to sleep like, you know, never woke up. Yeah. Shouting my head off to Essex, you know. And it wasn't until eight o'clock that he eventually woke Are up. Are you joking? No, and come round and dragged me out with some great difficulty, by the way. Yeah, so, Lucky he didn't yeah. have a public yeah, so indecency st- order or something, mate. Yeah. But that was the first uh, rave in the UK. Really? And apparently it was next door to Harefield Hospital. It made uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, national newspapers. Yeah. Apparently uh, there was two heart attacks and three oh miscarriages God. or something. Yeah, really? that was the first, the night of the first rave. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so I digress. So Saturday night, I say, uh, get back at 2, 3 in the morning after the <laughs> uh, Harefield Curry, uh, pub cast. And then Sunday morning, going to the calf. Yeah. Couldn't go to Harefield Calf because it didn't open on Sunday morning. Yeah. So what we used to do was go to the Farlow's Calf, mm. right? And that's how I first met Mrs. Briggs. Wow. She um, used to uh, uh, be the manageress, I think, yeah, of the cafe. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, um, that's what I've heard. Yeah, she was a manageress in there. Uh, bless her. Long time ago now. Yeah. That's where I first met her. Wow. And in fact, I actually remember Steve. First time I met Steve uh, was when he turned up, I guess he was about 24. Yeah. And fished a road bank at Harefield. Wow. And then uh, sometime after that, he started the relationship. Yeah, get a free breakfast job done, get a free Steve. Well, <laughs> get a free, yeah, yeah, he's shrewd, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bless her, bless her, Joan. What a lovely lady. Yeah, well in her eighties now, isn't she? Still um, going, still catching them as well. Still catching yeah. them. Yeah, but you know, so, so I've known Joan since um, nineteen eighty eight. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I digress. So we'd have uh, breakfast at Farlow's. By the time we got back to uh, Harefield, it's eleven. Oh, the pub's open. So we'd shoot back to the bank, pack yeah. up, pack up, go over to the holes and barge, have a couple of pints. Uh, we must have been a bit wary of drink driving. I don't know whether there was laws in, but I, yeah. I don't think we're... Oh no, yeah, I think there was, because I think I used to have lager tops, just a cup, so I only had two pints. Just 20 then, lager tops. <laughs> no, only two, because we're driving. Yeah. And, and then drive home. Uh, wow. And despite... What I tried to do to the uh, country. It is impossible no. to get out of that yeah. culture. That was yeah. the scene, wasn't it? That was the scene. And when everyone's doing it, mm. you know, you're kind of a bit of a boring fart you know, if you don't. The only two that didn't uh, were a couple called Care Bear and Frogger. Mm. Um, Frogger, Simon Lavin, mm. shortish guy, went on, uh, caught loads of fish and... Um, Certainly made a name at Halton and all that. Uh, lovely lad. He, he he fished on Nash Bait for many years. I don't know why he's still doing it, thinking about it. Mm. I bet he is. He's a kind of... Yeah. Give it up. But yeah, Simon Lavin's well-known the carp scene. Um, he's 
colleague, Care Bear, his name was Chris Lavin. Yeah. Um, a very unique angler, a fishing machine, incredibly uh, talented. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those two wouldn't go in the horse and barge. You know, they, you know, they were serious anglers. They was there to fish. How did they get the names Froggy and Care Bear? I have not got a clue. No, I've not got Good a clue. Answer. But yeah, you can look back at <laughs> my possible angling uh, achievements and judge them if you like. But possibly the biggest one ever was getting Simon Lavin in the horse and barge. Is that what you do? It Abducted. was impossible. It was impossible. <laughs> and I managed to get him in there on a uh, Saturday lunchtime. Yeah. Um, it was a red hot day. Maybe he just wilted or the constant pressure of me going and some, come, Chris, you've got to go and have a pint. But I'll never forget, he kept looking at his watch. Yeah. And I said, Chris, aren't you enjoying yourself? Why'd you keep looking at his watch? He said, because like, it's 23 hours or something like that. He said, I said, what do you mean 23 hours? He said, it's 23 hours since I caught a carp. <laughs> Meaning, well, I've got to catch one every 24 hours. Yeah. Wow. You was a top rod if you caught five carp. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and this bloke is stressing because he hasn't <laughs> caught one in 24 hours, you know, but but they actually caught nothing that season. Really? Oh, yeah, because another absolute right and proper rule, just like, you know, I stopped fishing on the uh, uh, works, is that they didn't count. Uh, oh, if, if you're at the pub. If, if those caught during opening hours. <laughs> You know, you're cheating, aren't you? <laughs> Strike yeah. them off the record. Yeah. Anyone boys. can catch you if you've got the lake to yourself. Yeah. You know, so they didn't can. Anyway. That is good angling, though. Everybody else goes to the pub. You stave off the peer pressure and, mm. and properly fish it. But yeah. that sounds like pretty incredible times. Like, Well, it, you know, it's also coupled with, you know, that was, I mean, you remember I mentioned that 76 summer? Yes. This summer was the next yeah. super hot one. Yeah. Um, that's the one where it wasn't quite as long as summer, but the temperatures absolutely went into the 80s. Yeah. Uh, it was unbelievable. You know, you know, there was reasons why I was naked, but you wanted to be naked anyway. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, some d- I remember, I remember um, one morning, uh, I used to take me Doberman. I used to have a Doberman. A called, Doberman? I had a Doberman called Khan. Wow, good, good name. He was... Um, Really famous, proper carp dog. He was the only uh, um, uh, dog member of the Carp Society. Really? Yeah. And, um, well, mate, I'll get on to... It was because of Khan, I think, that, shall we say, I had a very close relationship with Shirley. Right. Because she loved dogs. Okay. And, you know, she, you know whenever uh, Khan was there, she'd come over to me. What I didn't realise was that it possibly could have been about more about Khan. But so- <laughs> but on this, uh, he used to, I used to have a brolly, and I used to put him uh, an old sleeping bag down the, yeah, the, the back can. of my bed. Yeah. So between me and the brolly. Yeah. And he used to uh, sleep on that. Well, he had a habit. If he wanted to get up for a, a, a pee, mm. he just put his nose under the back, bottom of the back of the brolly. Yeah, you know, lift it just, up and get just out. Go. Yeah. And I would be constantly be aware that the brolly's gone boing and then gone back. <laughs> Anyway, this really hot night, you know, it was just so uncomfortable, yeah. you, know, you know, those sticky yeah. nights, mosquitoes and everything. Um, I was aware that he'd done it. And then I got up in the morning. And he used to jump over the top of me. What? You know, to get back there. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I hadn't thought, he hasn't jumped back over me. I yeah. got up, there's no dog. Oh. You know, so I wandered yeah. you know, around down, down the causeway, no dog. You know, go on the other side, the back, because a large area, you know, there's a bit, not, huge lake next to it, you know, large area of wilderness. Yeah, of course. You know, I'm beside myself. You know, I've looked all around for an hour. You know, can't yeah. find him anywhere. Absolutely gutted. Oh, fuck. So I thought I'm going to have to go up to the police and report it, just pray. Yeah. You know, someone's uh, seen him when he comes yeah. up, yeah. And I've walked up to the car park. He's laying out of it, right in the middle of the car park. You're joking. No, I can only assume it's because it was all gravel. It's the only place there weren't no mosquitoes. Really? Was oh, a- yeah. absol- absolutely out of it in the middle of the car park. Mad. Did we have a row? Really? The stress he yeah. put me through. Yeah, did yeah. we have it's a It's horrible, row? isn't it? Mm. Yeah, they really do make you worry. <laughs> yeah, dogs. <laughs> well, another, oh, yeah, no. There was another time we was um, being a bit naughty. Um, you know, there's always one you pick on. Yeah. Where's well, this bailiff? Directly picked on. <laughs> um, I won't go into the many reasons why. Anyway, one uh, we, got, we got up uh, one morning and he's still asleep, door zipped up. Yeah. 
So we put aerial bombs around his oh. That backfired. They bloody melted. His Did they melt the all, all holes in it. We to, oh, man. We had to buy him a new one. But anyway, he lit them off and all the hysterics. Look around, Khan's gone. Yeah? Yeah. Just never saw him go or whatever. Just yeah. disappeared. Again, we were all searched around. We have all searched Harefield, called the next door, couldn't find him. I'm beside myself. And I just happened to glance down the road bank we was on towards you know, the road and surely standing the other side of the gate with Khan. With him. Yeah, yeah we scared the hell out of him with his yeah, fireworks. Yeah. His natural reaction is, where can I go where I feel safe? He ran to the pub. She was in the kitchen. <laughs> she was in the kitchen <laughs> and uh, he just come in. She thought I was in the bar. <laughs> So you know, so she, you know, yeah. she got him in the uh, kitchen with her for half an hour right, until she <laughs> brought him out to see me, and I wasn't there. You talk about conditioned car panglers doing like the yeah. same thing, going mm. down the horse The dog's condition, yeah. absolutely unbelievable. Well, he Brilliant. he could drink uh, a pint of lager at a go, you know, no, half a pint. Sorry, you <laughs> RSPCA. You know those, don't you know those big this. square ashtrays you used to get? Yeah. In the well, they take half a pint of lager, and he used to down there. Well, he's me party trick with him. Was uh, he love a bag of crisps? Yeah, right. Yeah, but if you put a bag of crisps on the floor, you just go. He had huge paws. He go it. whack, yeah. right? And so you know when you when you smack a bag of yeah. crisps, it goes pop. Yeah, right. So whenever there's birds around, I say, um, "Can I have um, a pint and a half of lager and a packet of crisps, please?" Yeah. So get me a pint of lager. I get the ashtray. Pour the other half a pint into that, right? And then I'd throw the pack of crisps on the ground, kind of go pop. <laughs> Everyone, all the birds look around, wow, look at that dog. He opens his own bags of crisps. <laughs> then I put the lager down, oh my God, he drinks lager too. <laughs> you know what? He could drink, not well, he could drink eight pints of lager. What? I used to keep him to four because after that he was a bastard. He really was an arse, you know, when he had more. But yeah, he could drink four <laughs> pints of lager. This dog, mate. Yeah, he was he was cool. <laughs> he was cool. Oh my days. Well, aside from the crazy partying and the slightly abused dog, um during that time and during this time for you, you've obviously you've also come up with a bunch of revolutionary sort of tackle advances, if you like, and ideas. So talk us through talk us through them. It's kind of slow because, like I said, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's been mixed between um, uh, the partying and uh, the the occasional fishing. But basically, um, nothing really happened in the summer other than having a mad time. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and I make no excuses for it. Um, I met some great people there; they're still friends to this day. Um, many fell through the, uh, along the roadside because what we never realised was the amount of dough he was doing. Yeah. You know, one guy, um, um, I bumped into his mate a couple of years after. I said, what the hell happened? You know, he just disappeared like yeah. in the September. And he said he'd cleared out uh, the family uh, bank <sighs> account to keep up with you lot. You know, and now he's lost everything. His wife, when she found out, divorced him. You know, the amount of money he was doing, yeah. you know, as you can yeah. imagine. Yeah, but um, so we're into the summer. Um, it's coming up to the uh, Cone Valley reunion, right? Yeah. Uh, every year there was a reunion for all the old anglers who used to fish it and those ones still fishing it to uh, all get together for this weekend. Yeah. Okay. Um, by this time, Dougal is running. Yeah. Harefield. Yeah. You know, yeah, me and him have got on really well. Um, John Stent of Farlow's, there's a tackle shop there which I used to supply. Mm. And John Stent was bemoaning to me what a nightmare it was running Farlow's. You know, it was all, you know, the fence was always being cut mm. down and people breaking in. Yeah, you know, there was a murder there. Did you know that story? No. Mm. A murder at Farlow's? Yeah, um, there was a paedophile fishing there. And, um, oh, God. Yeah, and... Um, so, like, registered on the on the list, oh, or people knew about. I don't think it was such a thing. Oh, was it not? But he had preyed on. Um, I think he had preyed on uh, the daughter of one of the people fishing there. Oh, anyway, one night, this guy and 
to his mates um, after they'd been in the Farlows bar, yeah. all tanked up, went round there and set to uh, <sighs> in with lumps of four before. Wow. It's winter. They then gone back and had a, a scheme for more and thought they'd have another go at you know, hurting him. But yeah. they'd gone back and found him dead. So, <laughs> you've got to laugh, think about this. They put him on a push bike. They've put him on a push bike? Yeah, yeah. And pushed him round Farlow's to the canal. Oh, and dumped him in there. And threw him in there. And he froze up that night. So he wasn't found, uh, I think, for another few weeks later. You know. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, that was awful. So... I said to John, look, yeah, Dougal, yeah, he's out, he's kind of not got a lot of work. I think Dougal is doing a bit of um, uh, landscaping, whatever. Okay. I said, I get the impression he's not got a lot of work. He could sort this out for you. Mm. Yeah. And so he offered Dougal a job. So in Dougal taking over Farlow's, he also uh, took over the bailiff in head bailiff and yeah, management yeah. of um, Harefield. Yeah. Okay. So he's decreed that any angler who comes to uh, the reunion, uh, Calm Valley reunion, uh, so they don't have to worry about drink, drawing or whatever, they can bivy up on Harefield. Yeah. So they become basically a campsite. Party central, mate. Party central, yeah. Anyway, before that, weekend before, do a, a time before there'd been a guy for a, a firework party. Right, right, and one of the syndicate had, I think he'd gone on Island White for holiday or whatever, right, and he met this bird down there and brought her back. So, in other words, she left home, yeah, yeah, right. And I'll never forget it. We're having this far, it might have been a far and a barbecue, but it couldn't have been Guy Fawkes night because it wasn't that late, anyway. Um, he's brought this bird along to this uh firework party, whatever night, thing. and Dougal. Just went up to her and said, come on. And she went off with him. Right? <laughs> so she'd become his item. Right? Oh, my days. Anyway, he's in the Horse and Barge River. Yeah. And she's a right gobby bitch. And she gobbed off that she was 17. Oh, right in front of Shirley no. and her barmaids. Well, yeah. which has put, put Shirley in an in a untenable position. Yeah, exactly. If she knowingly has someone... In her pub, drinking underage, she could lose her licence. Yeah. So she turned round and said, until you can prove you're 18 of age, you can't come Check in here drinking. Yeah. yeah. Dougal flipped. Oh, you know, he was that type, black and white, you know, and stormed out. Right. It's now Colm Valley weekend. Uh, Shirley used to put on loads of food at her own cost yeah. and whatever. Yeah, because you've got to remember, yeah, you know, you've got to realise, you know, what a magnet it was. You know, mm. on a summer's night, yeah, you know, there might be a hundred, yeah. two hundred carp anglers. Yeah, mad. Yeah. I remember uh, one summer's weekend, I uh, managed to whip, right, and I had a thousand quid, a thousand quid whip round, whip. Wow. Yeah, you know, that just went. You know, it's mental. That's how many anglers, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course, there's a story of um, Lockie, you know, how he got wiped out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, that yeah. was a you know, summer's night. You know, everyone's drinking outside, masses, and, you know, these piss heads come over the hill, uh, lost control, and uh, wiped him out. Yeah. You know, hence, yeah, I used yeah. to say, had more stainless steel. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, there's so many. But, um, yeah, so, because Dougal, in effect... Uh, can't go in uh, the horse yeah. and barge because his bird's trapped off. Um, he decreed that the reunion would be in a, a different pub in Harefield. Right. Right. And so all the syndicate are in a right conundrum. Yeah, what do you yeah. do? What do you do? Right. And I attract trouble. Fact, yeah, because I was, you know, a name and influence, or whatever. Yeah. Everyone used to ask my opinion of things. Yeah, yeah. And in this case, what are you doing? Oh, well, no. I, you know, I was drinking the Olsen Bar. Just Shirley company said, Kim, what's going on?" You know, she said, "You know, I've heard the reunion's been moved to Airfield Village." Yeah. And I said, "Well, Dougal's trying to get people up there, but to be honest, Shirley." There's only one place I want to be, and, and I know, yeah. you know what you, you know. I said, you know, so I'm coming at least. Yeah, and I said I know a few of the others are, t- uh, are going to come as well. I said, but yeah, I'm going to go up in the Hairville village, village, have a pint with Dougal, 
to appease him. But then I'll be here later, darling. I told him. So yeah, you kept the peace pretty well there, Kev. So I Which goes happened? up. I goes up there. I'd never been this pub. It's a poxy tiny little place. You know, it was solid. You know, it wasn't big enough. Yeah. And all I could see was his head you know, uh, sticking above everyone because he was too good sitting on a bar stool. Right. Yeah. Couldn't get near him. Right. It was awful. You know. So I stood in the corner with my bird. Actually, we had a pint. And I said, fuck it, let's get out of here. Yeah, go down go. the Orson Barge, you know, where you're, you're lovely people we know, you know, and, you know. So I'm not kidding you. By the time we parked up and got in the Horse and Barge, everyone we'd left in that pub was in the Horse and Barge. Really? It's, it's like, Nash is gone. Now we let's can all go. go. Right? So anyway, we're all drinking. Suddenly, bang. Uh oh. The doors are flowing open. It's like, you know, the Wild West. Oh, no. Dougal's coming. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. You know. He was pulsing, his whole oh, forehead no. and neck was pulsing. It was like something out of you know, the Hulk. Yeah. And he said something like, right, you fuckers, yeah. get out of this pub and get off my lake Shh. before I bash you all up on your tackle. And so I'm standing there and like they all looked at him, right, mate. put their beers down and all sheepishly walked off, out to go over to the lake and pack up. Like Maiden still to be out and Phil Harper. Yeah. And I said, are they fucking sure? I said, I'm the guy over and have a word with Dougal. He said, leave it. Oh, my God. You know, uh, yeah. Maiden knew Dougal much better than me because Dougal was on Saturday, remember? Yeah, yeah, of course. So he's known him for more years. Yeah, yeah. He said, leave it. He said, you get hurt. Yeah. And that, in essence, was a catalyst that changed everything. Right. Um, Dougal become... Really, really nasty. He lost his head. He lost his head. So that was a trigger point. That yeah? was a trigger point to Dougal losing his head. Because uh, there, there was a guy on Harefield who used to creep up to him who could influence Dougal. Okay. Right? Um, and the biggest snakes ever met in my life. Uh, actually runs a fishery in Thailand. I'll say no more. Oh, okay. Um, bloke caused so much damage, you know. But, but you know that that season was the first the best season I had on uh, fishing social in my life. Yeah. Within a year, the whole syndicate was destroyed. Mm. You know, and it's basically down to him, not yeah. Dougal. You know, Dougal just led on. You know, uh, I'm just saying it how it is, but I'll, you know, I'll make it clear. You know, uh, we got over our differences, and me and Dougal have been you know, really close mates, you know, for many, many years. But yeah. at the time, um, I think I become um, an enemy in yeah. Dougal's eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It then wasn't helped because Dougal is uh, losing favour with John Stent. I think because John Stent felt threatened by him. Yeah, John Stent's way around that was to say. I'm going to let uh, Nash run the tackle shop. Stent had approached me and said, yeah. you want to take over the tackle shop? I can't run it make any money. Yeah. Well, uh, Catchem you know, uh, you know, also had a tackle shop in Lincoln. Right. You know, uh, you know, when I inherited it from Rod. Yeah. You know, I didn't want the tackle shop because it wasn't making any money. So I thought, great, we can take all the stock to Farlow's busy area. Yeah, job done. So I thought it'd make money. Yeah. What I didn't know is... John Stent said to Dougal, right, Nash, you take over the tackle shop, so I don't need you anymore. Oh, no. What the fuck that had to do with him Bayes in Farlow or whatever? But that... Yeah, that's killed it, hasn't it? That that killed it and nearly killed me. Yeah. Stent, what an arsehole. He turned out. So, uh, so Dougal, did... already is in a bad place, yeah. and now seen red, I've lost him his job. Right? Oh, no. Yeah? Firstly, yeah, there's a... Now I lost his job. And I become public enemy number one. Yeah. Um, and it got really bad. Okay. Um, so now we're into winter. Um, and I don't want to go near the horse and barge for it so much, really. So, so is he back in the horse and barge then? Um, Do you go No, he not? wasn't. No, he wasn't. No. But um, I just, I just want to keep, keep yeah, out. Yeah, keep a all. distance. Yeah, keep yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I decide I want to get into the fishing. Um, I'll never forget it. It was a cold winter's day and I turned up and fished a swim called Loftus Row. Mm. It's 
up the top end near the workings. Remember, I said there's been a red hot summer. Yes. Uh, the levels really dropped. There's actually bars yeah. you know, begin to poke out the uh, yeah. out the water. Um, I've had um, I think three takes all summer, and I've cast out and just got the third rod out. To my utter astonishment, I've had a screaming take. Oh. The monkey climb has hit. The monkey climb has hit the rod, then j- dropped straight back. Yeah. Savage drop back. Picked it up, winding like a maniac, and the lines come through. Rod has been, been yeah. cut off. Cut off, yeah. Gutted. Yeah. I'm just tackling up again, and one of the other two rods gone off. No. Picked it up, leaned into it, healthy curve, nice fish, good fish, suddenly straight oh, cut no. off again. Still holding the rod, and the third rod's rolled off. Is that wow. the same as the first one? Hit the butt, drop back, cut, cut off, off again. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, I've had three takes in like that probably is... 15 minutes, in winter as well. That's yeah. horrible. I just stood there in utter disbelief. Yeah. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. You know, this swim is unfishable. Um, so I decided to move around the other side, because Essex was on the other side of the road bank, and there's no... Gravel bars found there. Right. I've gone down from him to a swim called a stick, where there's a stick that marks a bar, little bar, long way out, near the bottom. Cast out to it. Couldn't believe it. I had a take. No way. Yeah, this is winter, yeah? You know, I've, had, I've had nearly as yeah, many takes say, yeah. in a couple of hours. You get, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm playing that. Line went slack. No. Bloody hooker bent in, broken off. Oh, this is when we're using bent hooks and it had broke oh. on the bent. Talk about when your luck's out. Yeah. Anyway, um, Sitting there, bemoaning yeah. the massive issues with um, uh, <laughs> yeah. with the lake you know, and the calves and all that. And John turned around and said that he'd had a conversation with Dougal a few weeks before. And Dougal said that he was going to tie a lead to the hook link swivel with PVA, right? Mm. So when he cast out, the lead... People would melt and the lead would fall off. Yeah. And so the lead wouldn't get caught up in the swan muscles or the flints. Yeah. I said, well, that ain't going to work, you know, with the toe and everything. Yeah. You know, no chance. The rig would be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the massive toes on there. You know, could go anywhere. I said, you know, apart from that, you know, how are you gonna, you've got no lead to help pull the hook in. Yeah. Right. But it got me thinking. Um, at the time, we sold. We also sold a, a, a pike range, okay. and in that range was a, a product we named a dead bait clip. Yeah, it's, you put. You know what one of them is like a drop off indicator clip. No, no, no. Basically, uh, the, the, the this was all mouldy, but in essence, we, when we used to pike fish, yeah, uh, with heavy with dead baits like mackerel or herring, they're very soft, didn't they? Yeah, you put the trebles in, and if you whacked it, they pull out. Yeah. So we used to, um, above the trace, have a large hook, yeah. cut the point and the barb off, put rubber over it, Yeah. right? Then we'd tie a loop of mono around the uh, dead bait's tail ah. and hook it over that hook. Right, So yeah. that hook and the mono took all the, the weight off, yeah, off yeah. the hooks. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as it hit the water, the dead bait would bounce off. Yeah. Right, it'd be fishing. Uh, and that idea just come to me. And we was using helicopter rigs at the time. Yeah. So I cut back the clip on the end of the helicopter rig where you touch a lead to. Yeah. So it formed a hook. I tied up, um, um, I had some light line on there. We occasionally used to use really light mono for hairs. Okay. Don't know why. Yeah. Or, or it had been left in my tackle box for years. But I had some one and a half pound line in there. Yeah. So I tied a, a lead to that, tied the other end to the hook, and I put the swivel... Uh, in the lead over the hook over the, yeah, and yeah. I whacked it out and then pulled it back and as I pulled back I could feel the resistance yep. and I felt the resistance go wow yeah you know uh, Essex is watching all this yeah you know so he set to you know and for a process of experimentation uh, over that session others you know we really cracked this rig um what i learned for example you know, every, you know when i first did it was a pound and a half line every time um he was pulling back he was losing the lead yeah so, but i worked out that um i worked out two things one one basically 
to get it to break off, uh, a pound of line represented an ounce of lead. Really? So if you wanted to use, to maximise um, bolt yeah, effect yeah. so the line wouldn't break too easy and uh, the best chance of getting it back, if you're using a three ounce lead, you use three, three pound, pound line. line yeah. Yeah. And so if you didn't get a take, if you was careful, you could pull it back. Yeah. But I also learned that you know, it was critical in getting the hook right so it always fell off. Yeah. But I also found that it didn't really have to. You know, if it didn't come off the hook, when you got the take, it would bounce oh, yeah, off on anyway. the take, yeah, so yeah. We, we was really working on not losing less unless we had to. Um, and I really perfected that. The problem is it's winter uh, and you know, you're not catching anything. Yeah, In fact, I never tight. got another chance. A couple of weeks later, it froze up. Uh. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, prior to this, I should say... Um, I'd taken up um, consultancy with Dara. Um, John Middleton, the boss, approached me and asked me if um, I'd be interested um, because they needed, like, he felt they needed a carp rod, yeah. a carp consultant. Yeah. You know, they primarily rods then. Uh, I didn't, Nash didn't make rods, mm. couldn't afford to make rods. Uh, and so it was a so no yeah, brain to no me. Brain, you know, yeah. I'm getting paid to design rods for them, and it would also help market the name of Nash. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was introduced to this guy called Nab- Nabal Nadira. He was a Japanese rod technician, mm. um, the most experienced rod designer in the world. Yeah. Um, I think I think I was once told he designed two thousand rods. Wow. Was what happened? Uh, the Japs used to send their uh, trainee uh, designers over to do a four-year stint at Darwin, Scotland, right? Right, well, okay. The ball was so talented, and this was a time when Darwin was struggling and needed development that Middleton asked if they could keep him. Mm. And I think he ended up staying there for like 12 or 15 wow. years. So he got all this experience of building European rods. So I was introduced to him. Um, the first thing I immediately had, uh, noted that Darwin whisker rods weren't properly um, rated. Yeah, they used to be that thick. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, a two pound test curve rod is only <laughs> yeah, that yeah. thick. But it's only but really yeah. a pound and a quarter, for yeah. example. Yeah. So I re rated them so the test curves were right. But that wasn't really what I was interested in yeah. and why I was so excited and wanted to work for Darwin. At the time, if you fished relatively short, so up to 50, 60, 70 metres, you'd have a furish action rod. Mm. But that couldn't cast the maximum distances. So if you wanted to fish long range, you'd have, we well, all using Horizons, it was yeah. a Rod Hutchinson rod. It's yeah. basically like a huge tapered thing. Only that much of the tip would move. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And that's a rod you use at long range. Of course, if you use it at short range, you just pull off or yeah. snap out. There's nothing that could do both. And in my head, I couldn't understand why you couldn't combine both. Yeah. Right? And so went for those. Then I explained to my dream concept. And, mm, problem. Like, what? <laughs> Can't do it in the ball. Yeah. No, no, didn't say that. Just a problem. Okay. So off he goes. Couldn't believe it. In a week. A week. A week. A whole box arrived. Uh, he with sounds- all the range. He translated the whole lot and you know, had them sent in a week, going through them. So now a, a two and a half pound test curve is actually what me and you know. Yeah. Just one thing missing. My dream concept rod. So I rang him up. He said, oh, Kevin, it's no problem. <laughs> How big a problem? <laughs> Very big problem. What, you, you can't? I can't do it. Didn't say that. It's a big problem. Yeah, this is how the Japanese are. Yeah. Two months later, um, upturned the first rod and it just blew me away. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, this concept of having a stiff uh, butt to middle, yeah. but then you know, getting the softness yeah, of, yeah. Uh, you know, was what I'd envisaged and he'd uh, created Brought to life, yeah. in the amorphous. Yeah. Uh, and the amorphous, um, I think it's fair to say, yeah. become the biggest selling cart rod of all time. Yeah. And it is still... Um, the template for yeah. all, yeah, yeah. all rods a day, you know, so it enabled you just to have basically one rod, yeah, uh, to you know, to fish short, short and medium, long. or yeah, long, yeah. you know. Um, prior to that, or uh, so I, I de- developed them, I took them uh, to Harefield, 
Um, probably it was, I can't remember if it was the second season or the end, middle okay. of the end. It might have been the middle of the first. Yeah, it was the middle of the first. Yeah, it's probably around August I got them. Um, I'd also uh, been looking at reels. Um, I was very aware uh, that um, I had this big issue uh, mm. with uh, reels at um, Harefield. And to my mind, it wasn't about the casting distance because, you know, I was aware that, the, you know, I could just use a, a, a bigger sport wheel, so like sea wheels. Yeah, of In fact, I started using Shimano Biomasters. Yeah. It wasn't about casting distance. It was about the practicality of being able to land a fish. So, yeah, I could have cast eight-pound line yeah. to the middle now where the others were because I had the rods. Yeah, but cut off central. Cut off central. Yeah. And so the whole... Uh, big spool thing that I started was about being able to cast a decent line, uh, line strength and yeah. abrasion resistance, you know, because it's simple. Um, if you've got a line, say, of eight pound, yeah. um, it's going to have roughly half the uh, abrasion resistance of one of 15. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's also the chemical makeup that helps, but the key thing in uh, what, how easy a line cuts is how thick it is. Yeah, of course. So, So I wanted... Uh, to be able to cast 15 pound line 120 mm. or more meters, which was impossible mm. until um, so I was looking through this Dara catalog, this Japanese ha- uh, catalog where you know they've just brought up for Japan. Um, the reels that were sold into Japan and America never come to England yeah, until yeah, yeah. Uh, they were finished with. And I saw these uh, amazing sea reels, these huge bucket spools. As yeah. As they was called then, you know, that come about because I've started to use them at Harefield. And one of the uh, lads come around and said, Fucking hell, Natty, what are you using? Buckets. <laughs> and I asked them to, um, uh, if they'd import me three, which were the first uh, SS3000s wow. coming in the country. In fact, you know, um, I th- I'm using uh, scope gear now, scope real to me, and I was going to sell them. Along with the amorphous rods, Adam wouldn't have him. No, yeah, you could. Uh, yeah. Adam wouldn't have it because it's such part of uh, you know, the. Uh, That's history, mate. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm not sentimental like that. No, and so, you can't um, be selling that. So, Adam's uh, had them mounted. Uh, They're on his office, isn't on they? On his office wall behind yeah. him, yeah. So, I, I just wrote an article with a Carp Society mag where they wanted That's pictures. That's ridiculous. I mean, you've I, got. I, you've actually, got put a picture in saying, you know, I, I guess I'm be very proud that long after I'm gone, there'd be. Yeah, mate, that is a fundamental part in mm. carping history, culture, yeah. and fashion, mate, as well. Because people use big pits and stuff now, even if they're fishing 20 yeah. yards out. Yeah. But the concepts of like lead clip, essentially, early beginnings and, and formation and thought process, rods that can do everything rather than having different sets of rods to do whatever. And you sort of thinking around that cut off, high break and strain line stuff. They're free, absolutely paramount, sort of. Building blocks to yeah, what is the yeah, carpet, and, Yeah, I guess yeah, it's, I can be grateful. Maybe because just a cartwheel could, could be grateful yeah. about that first carp I lost at Harefield. Yeah, it's all coming Yeah, because that. if I'd walked away, yeah, and wasn't, you know, yeah, faced with that set of problems. Yeah, I've always said, you know, um, my personal innovation it's only been about recognising a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, yeah. how I, you know, I innovate things. I recognise I've got a problem. Yeah, you know, it's only when I recognise I've got a problem I find a solution. Yeah, you know? uh, and so Harefield come up with this huge number of problems for me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't have rods that cast that far. Yeah, and then when I could cast that far, yeah, you know, the lines weren't up to it. Yeah, you know? so that's how the uh, rods and the reels come about. And you know, from uh, that, yeah. and from that, as I say, I then made designed this break off yeah. helicopter rig. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, I thought, well, how can I make this for the masses? Because I was showing people it yeah, yeah, can't yeah. be asked. Yeah, really yeah. It's can't be asked. Fiddly, Look, yeah. I'm just showing you a way of how you're, you know, can stop losing carp. Yeah. So that's when I uh, set to uh, mm. making a commercial uh, version and come up with what I called the safety bolt yeah. bead. Which was then renamed by one of the copiers, you know, as yeah, a lead yeah. clip. Yeah, you know. and irregardless of you know, views of copying, uh, the fact is that probably hundreds of thousands of so-called lead clips have been sold oh, throughout the world, and you know, hundreds of thousands of carp 
have uh, been landed because of yeah, it. Yeah, totally. You know, it's solved a big problem. Massive. You know, yeah, massive. massive. And, you know, so, yeah, all those were down the hair field. Yeah. So, yeah, we're now coming to... How, how did... How, because obviously there's this this whole sort of dark cloud of the, the Dougal saga. But how did your how did you end on Harefield, and where did you go? How it ended, yeah. um, Dougal and me effectively completely fell out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, the season started. He's now after me, and funny enough, Zenon. Not quite right. sure how Zenon got in the target. But for example, he start he, he brought a rule into place that you couldn't uh, walk more than a meter out your swim. Yeah, you know, get your head around that. Yeah, you know, yeah, from a party lake to now you, you know, you're not allowed out your swim. Anyway, um, me and uh, Zen and Ron the um, row bank the second mm. week into the season. I went in the draw. You drew for swims, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I drew the last number out. There weren't any swims left, or rather. Dougal was the one yeah, who uh, pulled, pulled the him. numbers out of the yeah. swim. Yeah. And I say, this guy, this Thailand guy, he's like pulling all the strings now. And the atmosphere on there that first... Nice. The atmosphere on there that first week was awful. Anyway, um, the Japanese had brought someone over uh, to meet me. They're real designer. Okay. Right. I'd come up with the SSs, believe it or not, as a substitute, everyone's into big bait runners then. Yeah, okay. Uh, the big bait runners were just starting, you know, and Shimano had a bait runner with a reasonable sport. Yeah. And I kept on nagging them for ages to do a bait runner. And so they sent this Japanese real technician over to see me. Yeah. And then he was coming over on the X date in June. I said, I'm not being funny, John, but yeah, you, know, you know, you won't stop me fishing. I'll come to Scotland any other time other than that. So... That he come down to me. Right, yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, in my swim and Zenon walked over to see us and Dougal was sitting on the uh, oh, workings. Right. Remember, no one fished on the workings. You know, seen it. Uh, and he come straight round and banned Zenon. Yeah, you know, and uh, it just all went awfully wrong. Yeah. Uh, anyway, meanwhile, Essex John has got my break-off lead yep. development. And um, I'm off Airfield. Um, Rob Maynard had uh, told me, um, he's really kicking off with Dougal. You, you need mm. to stay out of the valley. I, I think I got this story a bit wrong, actually. Farlow's, it's this season where he, that's right, it's this season where uh, Dougal's lost his job. Okay. Yeah, it must be because he's still on Harefield. Yeah. So, so Dougal and me are falling out. Yeah. I'm in his black books because of how he's thought I'd gone against yeah, him, his girlfriend. Yeah. yeah, then John Stent is realising he's feeling threatened by Dougal and so uh, he uh, sacked him in the essence. Mm-hmm. And so it's all out war. And um, I said to made him around me, I said, I'm going to come down and sort it out. He, do. he said, don't. Oh, my days. Yeah, you know, I, I, wanted, I said, I'm on the front. He said, don't. No. He said, it's t- he's too violent. So yeah. um, I felt... Like I bottled it a bit, but yeah, you know, I listened to Mailing, you know, and the guy was you know, serious. You know, you know, yeah, I, I once I'll tell you a story. I was in the horse and barge one night <laughs> with yeah. um Essex and Dougal, and there was a bunch of Herberts, uh, right Jack the Lads, um, part of a bait company, I'm not going to mention which, uh, but they they set a guy on Dougal. Right, this is um, an ex pro boxer, right? And he's why did they set a guy on Dougal just for because Dougal was a sheriff, yeah. Right, this is okay, like the okay. Wild West, just like a mutiny. No, no, this is like the <laughs> Wild West, you know, you know. The gunslingers want to go up against a top gunslinger, oh my days. right? Yeah, Dougal was such a reputation, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Anyway, we're having a right chill in the autumn barge, and this bloke oh, walked man. in like a brick house door, you know, like at least a foot hard, uh, taller than Dougal. And he's walked up. He said, you're an ugly fucker, Dougal. Dougal went, what? Oh, my days. He said, you're an ugly fucker and you've got the biggest nose I've ever seen. Yeah. Can I Dougal said, look, mate, leave it out. You know, we're just in here for a pint of chill. Just leave it out, mate. And the bloke's turned around. He walked four paces. He turned around and said, in actual fact, you're even ugly and I thought you're oh, no. Yeah. It's clear it's going to kick off. And so Dougal... Wanted to get it out of the pub, you know. So he said, yeah. "Let's go outside." Yeah, yeah. You know, he's gone outside. 
this bloke hit him so hard, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, mm. He never went down. He just went like, boing, boing. Yeah. Well, do, he hit Dougal? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, Massive man. hit. Yeah, it would have. Would have fell Muhammad Ali, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dougal just leapt. He didn't. He didn't punch him. He just leapt and grabbed hold of him. Oh God! Right. He had him by the back of the head. He kicked yeah. his legs from under him, and he's going bang, bang, oh, bang, mate. bang into the curb. And then he's rubbing his face off. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we had to. You stop him, him off, yeah. You have to stop him. Yeah, well, yeah, Dougal, he's, you know, he's, he's had enough. Mate. You didn't, I won't go near Dougal. He's yeah, had enough, yeah, yeah. Gradually, you know, yeah, yeah, he lost it. And they were all standing opposite. He said, right, you see you next Tuesday. So yeah. Come and get him before I kill him. Oh, my God. And they come over and they lifted him they up pick like him this. Up. Yeah, and took him away. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. so I know. Yeah, you don't want to mess. Yeah, you yeah. don't want to mess around. Yeah. Him. When someone is that type, they just lose it and all reaching and goes. So that was the end of my time yeah, at Harefield. Yeah, yeah. And the other sad thing is, a sad, um, um, Shirley lost the pub. Yeah. Uh, the guy she was in partnership with, we've sold it under. Yeah, yeah. I haven't told the story, but there's like a will they, won't they love story going on between me and Shirley. Yeah, yeah. Was it going to happen or wasn't it? You know, uh, it's, one of them, you know, but, but yeah, she was, you know, she was such a legend down the valley. Apparently, she'd only had a relationship with one other car bangler, and she used to turn up at the Hairful Gate with his dinner and beer on a tray. Everyone wanted that, you know? yeah, yeah. And yeah and so, yeah. how come it never happened, mate? Mainly because of this moving on, do you think, or just because you? No, was- um, there was a Guy Fawkes party going going to be that winter, yeah, that November, and. um I was having a right rough time with my girlfriend. She was a right fiery, you know, nutty bitch. Yeah, and so I'd, I hadn't, I hadn't invited her up there for a few weeks. Anyway, we're all getting ready for the firework party, and mm. I've gone in the Orson Barge on this Saturday, and Dougal's, uh, sorry, Essex John's down the other end. We we cut the barman. It's going no, really, and like they're all glancing at me, right? So anyway, he's come up. Giggling away, like smirking. Yeah, you know, I know some of you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The essays, you know, what's going on here? You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, eventually he's uh, relenting. He said, Shirley fancies you. Oh. And the message I got is she's hoping you're coming to the Guy Fawkes party next week. Yeah. In other words, you're on for you're on. fucking yeah. shag, mate. Dead, sir. Am I? You know, he's a, he's a Pope Catholic. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll never forget it. Turned up on the... Uh, Turned, I went in the pub on the lunchtime and one of the barmaids has come over laughing. She said, you're in for a party yeah, tonight. You're having a good night. Yeah, She's gone out and got leather skirt, stockings and suspenders and everything. You know? It's like, oh, yeah. Oh, everyone everyone in the halls and bars, you know, it's, uh, it's yeah, Essex, yeah, yeah. Essex has gobbed off, you know, and they're really all, you know, Fuel in the fire. Yeah, and really like, come on, Nashy. You yeah. Know, because it was that kind of place. You know, just getting back to the fishing. You know, if you was... Because of the three bars, it could be very um, uh, busy fishing. You know, the, the fish, in essence, basically being one bar. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see the, the ones you didn't get, you put a rod in each bar. They get yeah. a take on, say, the middle bar. And they'd all go. And, yeah, the and they bar. just leave that rod in one bar. You know, yeah. That's where I learned about when you find a little spot, pile them all in it. Yeah. Yeah. This business now about f- spot fishing. Yeah. I've done it since the 80s. Yeah, three yeah. rods on a spot. Back Why, if you've got rods in areas where there's no action, do you leave them there? It's beyond me. Yeah. So, but you could really have it off. You know, and they were shellfish. You know, and, and what they would, in essence, do, they'd... Do like, like hooligans. They do a roar around the lake, yeah. a tour around the lake. Some of them get catch, they get caught, and they get fed up with that. And all go and sit in the middle. Yeah. So they sit in the middle for like a few weeks, and they get starving, hungry. Come yeah. back so out. you could get good hits. But the point is, if the, your mate in the next room was having it off, you know, you'd make him bacon so on his cups of tea because you're winning him. Yeah. You really wanted him to have a, yeah, you know, a yeah, catch. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, you know, there's none of this business nowadays of selfishness you yeah. know it was Different. that was part of it you yeah. know everyone was just so happy when someone called even though they hadn't yeah you know and everyone was so happy that you know Shirley fancies me even though she didn't fancy them <laughs> get stuck in that in fact Phil Harper you know Phil Harper was a pretty boy of car bang yeah. used to call him yeah I never get I was, uh, um, uh, that evening I'm in there 
So this is the you know the evening yeah, is all yeah. going to kick off. Me and a fella uh, at the bar. He's sitting on a bar stool. I'm standing next to him, and Shirley's come around the other side of the bar, mm. put her arm around me, yeah, put her legs around one of my legs, and started oh, oh, rubbing. And like Phil can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's always fancied her. Right? Yeah, and he turned around and said to Shirley, "What's Kevin got that I ain't?" And she said, "You start at the bottom." I didn't know what she meant, but his face just went. Oh, he'd been shagging one of her barmates. Oh no! He probably would have had a chance with. Yeah, he, he was. was yeah, he was such a handsome bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, but yeah. So so yeah, and he's, yeah, he just right after he went, she went. Yeah, make up for me, mate. You know. So, but <laughs> anyway, so the pub's full up. It's rocking. You know, the the electric in the air because you know this yeah. thing that's going on between Nashy and uh, Shirley, and she's. Opposite me, the other side of the bar, you know, pulling pints and we're talking. And it's just suddenly the lights went out and the sun, this, her face went black. And she's looking over my shoulder, looks behind me, my bird's turned up. Oh, no. Yeah, I hadn't seen for free. She was a bit of a psycho, so that was that. Dead. Dead. Anyway, the next March, this is before that opening, yeah, yeah. The, John's phoned me up and uh, said she's lost the pub and she's having uh, and she's having a farewell party and she's asked specifically yeah. if you will come. Yeah. I said, when is it? He told me the date, um, Saturday the seventeenth of March. I said, I can't, mate. I'm off to the Canaries carping. Uh, First time I went to Canaries. So yeah, the next time things aren't meant to be. Are well, they, the next mate? time I saw her was a year before last at Roger Smith's funeral. Where they had the uh, wake at the horse and barge, yeah. and I have to say she's, yeah, you know, she was she was a lot older than us. You know, yeah. we're talking we was thirties then. She was probably well in her forties. You know, that mature woman in the prime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, she just had so much sex appeal. Yeah. I, I guess she's seventy now, and she's still you know, a real handsome woman. Yeah, yeah and had a lovely chat about the old days. You know, it was lovely to see her. Bless her. Yeah, so all this madness going on. You know, it's um. And that was um, the end of me at Harefield with the you know the Farlows thing kicking off. Rob said stay out, and so I'd done all the development with the break off lead and couldn't uh, milk it. But I'd given uh, John everything, and I think he went on to catch seventy carp. Incredible times, Kev. I think everyone can safely say that Harefield is looked back on as as such a sort of a formative part of the development of modern day carp fishing. And I think that is a brilliant place to leave off part two. And we'll be back with you for part three very, very soon. Thanks for that, Kev. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you all for listening and watching. See you very soon. Cheers, mate.